Yeah, we do about 3 million, 3.5 million a year. I was the worst one, bro. If I can go from dropping out in ninth grade, being literally suicidal, hating my life, not wanting to wake up, to making millions just a few years later, what the fuck are you capable of? Now I work two hours a week. I don't know if I mentioned that, but like, I, I don't do anything. Most local businesses, their problem is not they don't know how to get leads. Their problem is they're shitty business owners. So we've added on something called the hybrid model. So instead of just running ads and sending leads to these realtors and saying, hey, go close these leads, we actually teach them how to convert the leads. So if you could create that feeling for your clients of if you leave our program, you're leaving a community, there will be an inherent fear of death. I've seen people complain, dispute, and ask for refunds for the same information that I've seen other people become millionaires with. At the end of the day, brother, it's you. Welcome to the We're Gonna Make It podcast, where we talk about the nitty gritty tactics that underground entrepreneurs are using to build their businesses to the seven and eight figures. The goal of this podcast is to go into excruciating detail on the tactics and strategies that they're using right now. So hopefully you can implement it into your business and see more success. If you like tips like this, you can always subscribe to our free newsletter. But other than that, please enjoy the episode. Matt Shields. Yes, sir. Great to have you here, brother. Thank so I saw your YouTube channel, the video specifically, I built six SMMAs to prove it's not luck. Highly recommend everyone go watch that. But first off, how much money do you make, brother? How much money do I make? Our agency does about two hundred fifty thousand per month. Uh, per month. Yeah, it's done. It's done up to two hundred ninety. It's it, it hovers, but yeah, we do about three million, three point five million a year. And how old are you? Twenty two. Twenty two. Yeah. Baller. Okay, Thank bro. You. I'm really excited about this because when I watch your channel, you are kind of the opposite of what I see in most people that talk about SMMA or make content on SMMA, mm. in the sense that. I ran an SMMA, one of my first businesses, got to around 30K a month. That's like my best month. And what I always didn't understand was when I would buy courses for SMMA, everyone was focused on sales or yeah. getting clients for yourself. Yep. But they were never focused or teaching me, how am I actually going to get the people that I close their clients? So yeah. first, to keep it simple so everyone understands what's going on here, what service do you offer? Like, what are people paying you for? Yeah, and that is a great point. Like, that is the paramount problem in this industry is nobody actually teaches how do you make your clients money so what service i offer is facebook and instagram ads for real estate agents but on top of that what we've done differently where we've really tried to innovate as a company is we've added on something called the hybrid model so instead of just running ads and sending leads to these realtors and saying hey go close these leads we actually teach them how to convert the leads and so we've developed a community and a consulting component to the agency to where as Hermosi says, you want your service to become the solution to the client's entire business. And that's what we've worked on. We're not just a lead gen solution. We are a holistic solution to realtors because the fact is most local businesses, their problem is not they don't know how to get leads. Their problem is they're shitty business owners. Like a gym doesn't know how to operate or scale or keep clients or create an incredible client experience. Realtors don't know how to maximize their sphere of influence. They don't know how to effectively sell so we've taught them all of those things and that's where we've tried to kind of innovate our service delivery so i want to ask you how did you even learn how to make their business better than them when you're not actually running one but before Great we question. get to that later into the podcast yeah. i more so want to say like let's break it down as simply as possible sure you help real estate owner real estate real estate agents make more money make but by getting them people that are trying to buy or sell a house yeah so you find people that want to buy or sell a house and then yep. You're running ads to find these people yep. and those people book a call with the real estate agents, essentially. Essentially, we we run the ads to find the buyer or the seller. We send that information that we collect from that potential buyer or seller to the agent. Then we have a CRM where we help them follow up with that person and actually get a meeting to meet with them. And then we teach them the sales process okay. to take them from a lead to an actual paying client so they make money. Okay, so real estate agents that are looking to grow their business yeah. hire your agency to help them get clients. And basically from there, you just have this system where you send them, you run ads for for them yeah. under their brand? Um, Sometimes. Okay, so you run ads for them yeah. and then they basically just get sent the clients and that's what they're paying for you. How much do they pay you? So our average client pays $8,000 for six months, usually- Total or per month? Uh, for the full six months. Okay. We do a lot of paid and fulls. And then if they pay month to month, it's anywhere from 1500 to 2000 per month. And that's for ad, basically ad services, media buying in a way. 
Yep. And then the consulting on top of it and the training in the group. Okay. So how, what is specifically your method for getting them clients? So we're running ads on Facebook and Instagram. Facebook and Instagram. And the key, like in advertising, the best copy in the world, the best headline in the world, the best image in the world cannot beat a great offer. So we try to come up with a no-brainer, easy to click, easy to grab offer for our agents. Um, and usually that's a free home valuation because because of how uh, you know fluctuating the market has been in the last couple of years, everybody's like, well, what's my home worth now? What's my home worth yes. now? So that's gotten us a lot of clicks. It's worked for the last year and a half. Um, and then we do other offers at times we'll test, but we come up with a great offer, a catchy image, a catchy headline, because at the end of the day, the headline's the most important thing. And that's how we grab the info and then we send it to the agent. That's really smart because if I own a home, like I want to know how much my house is worth. And exactly. so if, like if it's free, why not? And then they click into it and they go through like, do they go through like a funnel? Or yeah. Is there like a VSL or? Both. So there's a funnel. We get their information. Um, we've tested the VSL, but we stopped doing it. Now we just get their information. We actually have something called geo mapping. So let's say you put in your home address into our funnel. It will pull up the Google Maps listing and satellite shot of your house. So now like the person's looking at their own house and like, oh, this is legit. Yeah. Because a lot of online ads on social media, it's like, I don't know if this is a scam or if this is real. So when you see that sort of technology, it makes it way more trustworthy. And that's helped us just increase conversion rates and opt-ins. Evaluation. They just have to. The realtor does it manually. On the call? And that's super important. On the call. In person. Oh. Because you can't value a home unless you actually see it. Mm. Like, it's like, it'd be like online oh, dating. That's smart. You can't say a girl's a 10 because you saw her Tinder profile. Right. You have to meet her in person. It's the same thing with a house because you have to see how it compares to the house next door, the rest of the neighborhood, all of that stuff. And it gets your foot in the door. And then now so they have like cool. that human connection in person. Even. Exactly. And so it's a way easier close for them. Exactly. Spot on. Yeah. That's really smart. Okay. So ad is free home valuation. What's the creative looking like? The photo? Good question. We've tested like a lot of stereotypical Canva images and those have performed well, but where we've tried to be a little bit different as a company is we actually pay a production agency to make these viral style pattern interrupting commercials. Um, and we do this for ourselves too. Mm -hmm. This is what's beautiful about this business is if you can provide yourself results and you can just say, look client, the same system that got you to be one of my clients, exactly. I'm going to run for you so you can get clients. It's like, well, all right, they got me. So we run Facebook and Instagram ads for our own agency too. Mm -hmm. That is our number one uh, acquisition channels, just paid ads. And so we come up with these viral style marketing commercials. One of them that has just gone crazy is called the real estate wrap. So we paid this guy, um, shout out to Joey if he's watching this. And he made this amazing, amazing creative where he just raps about real estate and all the problems. And it went viral. All the realtors shared it. And it got us, I don't know, probably made us like $700,000 in a year. And we paid $2,500 for the commercial. So we made those for our clients in their markets. So we have something called like the market's hot out here. It's time to sell your home. And so like we made an we made a video and a music video like that when the market was super hot. So little things like that have really taken our market to the next level. That's not touched on in a lot of yeah. courses of the creativity needed. You're basically running ads and you need to get people to click. Yeah. But I saw that where you literally made a music video and the lyrics are like speaking as a real estate agent to their problems, yeah. objections they're facing. And then that like got their attention. Yep. They loved it. And then they automatically shared around because they think it's funny. And now you're just getting so many clients outside of that ad. The best advertisement, David Ogilvy said, the best advertisement is one that doesn't seem like an advertisement at all. A music video does not seem like an ad. It's a music video. It's entertainment. But that was our best ad ever. But music videos have the product placement of like alcohol or exactly. whatever it is. Like they just have them in there. And, and they're easier to watch. Most ads are painful to look at. It's, like, it's almost subconscious. Yeah, 100%. So that's genius. And that is cool that because that's how you get clients. That's how yeah. you're marketing the real estate agents. But you're also going to do that for them. And so yeah. when you're on your sales calls, like they yeah. firsthand see, OK, this guy like it works. Yeah. So that's really interesting. OK, so that would be the typical just that alone is what my SMMA agent was or uh, company yeah. was like running an ad for him, getting them book calls, appointments or whatever, yeah. and then hands off and that was like probably, that's probably like the standard way to do an agency, but you go way deeper than that and actually teach them how to be better at their business. Yeah. Explain Correct. that. I only have one quick interruption for the podcast today, guys. And maybe this is a good time to share the podcast with a friend or throw it in your group chat if you're actually learning something because share the knowledge so you can all become better together. But I want to put you guys onto a big opportunity that I'm seeing in the world right now. And that is building software, but with no code. 
Typically, everyone kind of knows that software is the best business in the world, but you have to hire developers, it takes a lot of time, but we're in the future. And right now, you can actually build software with no code on a platform called Bubble. Not only that, you can actually plug AI into Bubble to build any AI software tool you want very quickly. We actually figured out how to build a AI tool to help students with their homework in just a few weeks. And we actually made a free course showing exactly how we did everything from plugging in the AI, building the actual app itself, and then even connecting Stripe to accept payments. And again, that's a completely free course that you can find in the link in the description below. Other than that, guys, enjoy the podcast, share it with your friend if you're learning something. This has been a really good one so far, and it only gets better. But you go way deeper than that and actually teach them how to be better at their business. Yeah. Explain right. that. Well, to revert back to what I, I said in the beginning, the most paramount problem for these entrepreneurs, these local business owners, is not that they don't know how to get leads or that they don't know how to market. It's that they don't know how to run a business. I can give you all the leads in the world, all the opportunities in the world. But if you aren't the person and you don't have the know-how to actually cultivate that into a transaction because you don't have effective follow-up processes, you don't know how to sell for the life of you. Like agents will come on our group calls and we'll do a role play and we'll be like, all right, I'm a lead. I'm potentially interested in selling my home. Call me. And the agents will call and they'll be like, it's it's terrible to listen to. It's 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 very, very hard to listen to. But that's why we focused on it because most of your clients, if you're an agency owner, they are taking your amazing opportunities that you're sending them and they're just completely fumbling them. And so we've tried to- and and they'll blame you and they'll say, these leads suck. It's like, no, they don't suck. You said, hey, do you want to sell your home with me as your opening line? Like you're, you're a bad salesperson. And so we're very ruthless with our clients. I'm like, look, the leads are the leads. The, the X factor is you as the agent, because I, I can send 20 leads to a rock star agent and they'll close maybe three of them. I can send 20 leads to a brand new scrub and they won't close any of them. And that's just the, the harsh reality of the business. So we teach them follow up. We teach them how to hire and recruit virtual assistants. We teach them mindset. We teach them uh, sales and how do you show up to a listing appointment. We teach them the entire business. So that's where we've really done things differently because the the underlying problem in SMMA is leads don't act. Leads are a commodity. Mm -hmm. Leads are so easy to get and you can't build an amazing business on the backbone of a commodity. Yeah, so it's kind of like getting them to be accountable, but without like being mean to them because they're paying you. Yeah. So, but we will call them out. You got, will got call them. If you have that relationship, great. Yeah. But so, but you're not a real estate agent. You've no. never sold a home yourself. I have no idea how to sell a home. Yeah. So, <laughs> how, are, well, how are you teaching these people when you know nothing about their world in theory? That is that is a great question, Brett. Um, the first thing is my mom's a realtor, okay. and my brother's a realtor. So I had a little bit of insight into how much of a problem this industry has, which is there's it's so outdated. They teach you how to grow business off of referrals. They don't know how to actually convert predictable acquisition sources like paid advertising. And so I just kind of saw how flawed the industry was firsthand or secondhand through my family. But the way we actually teach is we just bring in experts in the industry. Like we have a best-selling real estate author. Um, we're looking at bringing in some of the, the number one wholesaler in the country to come and do a mastermind with our agents. We bring in experts who are great at sales have built successful real estate businesses and we leverage OPE, other people's expertise. And that is what I love is that I don't need to know the shit. I just need to find the person who does and I need to know that I need to find them. And so if I can go and source these people, pay them 250 an hour, meanwhile my clients are paying me, you know, 2000 a month and there's 30 of them on a call, it's it's like $60,000 per that call or whatever and I'm paying the agent, the coach 250 an hour to do the call. So I'm just leveraging other people's expertise. And we're bringing them in and they're teaching the agents for us because I don't know the first thing about selling a house. I would completely fuck it up. So, yeah. So, again, this is focus. Again, this is what I mean by pro your product focus. Yeah. Like you were going, I've never heard of this before. And yeah. so you're going above and beyond for your clients. And I'm sure that after all these coaching calls or having all these real estate clients, you can kind of see like this person is getting the same kind of leads as this person, but this person's getting 15 clients paid a month. This one's only getting three. Literally. So you almost like can just learn from all the people doing it the best yep. and then bring that into your coaching for future clients. Exactly. And that that's and that's the management consulting process. I've heard Hermosi talk about this. You bring in all of like management consulting. You find you don't do all of the innovative ideas that's making a company successful. 
you figure out between all the companies, what are the few things that all of them are doing that are like indisputable? Like they're all following up with their leads in the first five minutes. They're all calling at least eight times, right? Maybe one of them's going and knocking on, on the door and dropping off a CMA, but the others aren't. So you just focus on what are the things that all of the successful ones are doing. And over time, we've discovered like the few key things that you have to do as an agent or as a local business owner to actually convert a lead. And then we just teach it to all of our agents because we have so much data. You know, there's hundreds of clients who have gone through the program between the high ticket offers and the low ticket offers. And we've learned from all of them and we've acquired data. And now we just try to kind of reteach that to everybody. See, and I love that you've learned this because you've learned this the hard way. Like, the yeah. first video, you, this is your sixth SMMA yep. where you're learning each one of these pieces. And now that you started your sixth one, you have all that knowledge and it compounds. Yeah. We'll talk about your story at, near the end of the podcast, but really I want to focus on, so Alex Ramosi has like, I guess another note here is he talks about like how he had to market his first gym, Yeah, how he's like, go put out flyers and yeah. so he puts out 50 and he thought he's like worked really hard and did a lot. And then he came back and the guy like yelled at him because he need to do 500 and so when you're a beginner you don't really know how much work it takes to be successful and people will again just protect their ego and not look in the mirror and be like it's because i'm not working hard enough product oriented you're a very product oriented person and you had a saying in that video that was it was like free trial referral system and great product explain why you are such a product oriented person our first couple of agencies which they succeeded uh but partnership, you know, different things happen where I got basically, I had to leave the agencies and, and start this one again. But the first few did succeed um, and they did well and they were product focused as well. So they were free trials up and then run a great free trial, get them as a paying client and then ask them for referrals. That's like how we grew our first three agencies to 20, 30 K a month in like three, four months was just free trials, referrals, etc. So why are you so product focused? Honestly, or what are the benefits of being product focused? I'll answer both of those. Yeah. The real reason I'm product focused transparently is because like deeply rooted in my nature is insecurity that I won't be enough for people. Mm-hmm. And like like studying great product CEOs, this is hardwired in their brains. It's like there's a, a deep amount of insecurity that they will never be enough. And so they have to build something that is so great that it's like irrefutable that they have served you well. And so like in, in the core of my bones is like, I just don't want to let people down. And so I want to build something really great. The benefits to that are, look at the most successful companies. They're incredible products. If you want to get to 10K a month, 20K a month, sales will get you there, sure. But if you want to get to a million a month, if you want to build an eight-figure business, if you want to get to 300K a month, you have to build something that people actually love to use. And studying Jeff Bezos, who I think is the greatest yeah. entrepreneur of our yeah. generation, um, I know a lot of Elon fans might hate me for that, but his whole thing is create value for customers and think in long-term time horizons. Like reading all of his shareholders uh, letters and just studying that, it's a relentless obsession with the customer. How can we provide them the most value possible? And so for me, that is the benefit is if you can provide them the most value, you can charge the highest prices, you will keep them the longest. And the best form of marketing is a happy customer. So it grows exponentially. As Naval says, you only sell because you don't know how to market and you only market because you don't know how to build product. So if you build product right, you don't have to market. You don't have to sell. The product does everything for you. So I think that's really the benefit. Yeah, it's the dropshippers dilemma where they think that they can just like get an instant, run an ad, convert. If it's profitable, they scale. But if you don't eventually get referrals, word of mouth, where one sale equals three because they're telling their friends, your ads will eventually become too expensive and you will not be profitable and your business will fail. And so one side note, I want to tell everyone here, if you guys haven't noticed already, he's name dropped at least five different quotes or ideologies of very successful business people. And you talked before we got in here, the success is the compound of the people that are in your team. Yeah. But it's also a combination of the information you're putting in your mind. Yep. If you are in a low income neighborhood and everyone around you is only making like $2,000 a month and they're in the cycle of low quality information, yes. that's all that's in your brain. And you can't like break out of that. So how are you supposed to be successful? That's he is filling his brain with the most successful business ideologies that have been proven to work and the right thesis is and then applying that to his business are why he's able to scale and in, in my opinion, so quickly at 22, because you're learning from the right people. I appreciate you saying that. I know we'll, we'll talk about the story later, but it, it, you just gave me an interesting insight, which is like, you know, well, I, we'll get into the story, but I dropped out, I dropped out of high school in ninth grade. So like I left school after ninth grade and I left the public education system. 
you become what you consume. And all I was consuming there was drama, negativity, hate, fear, a lot of fear in high school. And, or trigonometry. Yeah, bullshit, right? Bull. I, don't, I didn't even make it to those classes. But uh, <laughs> that's all I was consuming, and you become what you consume. So leaving that environment, as scary as it was, then I started looking to YouTube. And I always tell people, like, I went to YouTube University. That's why I make YouTube videos is because I was a student. Now I want to be a professor while I continue to be a student, too. So, like, yeah, man, I just I guess I got really blessed that I, I did drop out of school, as scary as it was, because then I started consuming from not Jimmy, the high school fucking quarterback, but I was listening to Jeff Bezos and people like Hermosi five years ago before anybody knew who he was. And like that's that that research at the end of the day, there's not there's no such thing as an original thought. So how can you how can you put the thoughts that are already proven by other people into your brain and actually understand them and comprehend them and leverage them? Like none of this that we've done is really me as like it kind of sucks to say it'd be cool to say it was my innovative idea. Bro, the hybrid model, Hermosi did that with Gym Launch. Joel Kaplan did that with Agency Lab. And our whole goal, like 18 months ago, I messaged our CEO when he first joined the business because I had to bring him in as a partner. I messaged him, dude, what if we built the gym launch for realtors? Agent launch. What if we did that? And he was like, cool idea. I'm not against it. That was it. But that was the backbone of what we did. It wasn't even original thought. It was just like we copied Hermosi. But that is the game. That is the game. Steve Jobs said, bro, and I'll quote another entrepreneur. Why not? Steve Jobs said, like, this is a fascinating story to me. He quoted Picasso when he stole Xerox's um, GUI like decades and decades ago, right? In the late 1970s. He quoted Picasso and he said, you know, Picasso had a saying, good artists copy, great artists steal. Mm -hmm. And we have always been shameless about stealing great ideas. Mm -hmm. And this is because he went to Xerox and he stole their GUI when they sued him $150 million because he stole this graphical user interface or whatever it was. He just stole it. He saw it, he stole it, he implemented it into Apple. Apple takes off, Xerox crashes out of the computer business. They stop selling, uh, you know, retail computers or whatever. He stole their idea. The greatest product-oriented CEO in history was stealing ideas and products from other people. Why are we trying to innovate as 20-year-old something entrepreneurs? Steve Jobs was stealing. Why aren't we stealing, bro? Like, the answers are out there. He literally went into their, like office park center like what was it maybe to sell apple to them or something and they showed him what they were working on yeah. like this windowed version of a computer where it used to just be like all like text based yes it's that's a crazy yeah they that's gave him a million dollars worth of pre-ipo stock for apple they invited him to their inner circle where they had all the most innovative technology in the world and he just says he saw the gui and he said they don't know how to market that we need that and he put it into the uh the macintosh and it's been history. And the same goes for like any industry you're in because these people have obviously spent a lot of time and money making mistakes and learning and you yeah. skip all their mistakes. Like this is your baseline now because it's working for them. Now make it your own or a little different. Well said. Yeah, I mean, Facebook did it when Snapchat came out with stories. They yep. instantly do stories. Then TikTok comes out. Now every social media platform has the infinite scroll. Smart people learn from their own mistakes. Wise people learn from the mistakes of others. So if you can just learn from all of the other people who have already messed up for you, you'll go way faster. Give me your input on the people listening to this right now that yeah. think that's wrong, that are to their core belief that think you're stealing, you're a bad person, and that they're going to discount your success because of that mindset right now. I mean, look, that's fine at the end of the day. Like it, it, it really doesn't matter, but I will, because I, I understand the moral dilemma. Like I do understand it. What I would say is, again, there is no such thing as an original thought. You're going to steal. The question is, are you going to steal something good or something bad? Because you're stealing somebody else's belief no matter what. Everyone go back and listen to where he said there's no such thing as original thought the first time and listen to that 60 seconds over two or three times. That will foundationally change the way you think about the world. Mm. But moving back to the actual tangible business, yeah. I want to make sure we fully understand what you're doing. Sure, let's get into it. So first off, imagine someone's new. How did you, you started with gyms. How did you yeah. get into that niche? How did you choose a niche? Good question. I did it completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I would I would choose a niche completely differently now. Um because of the quote you mentioned to me uh, that I think I said in the video, big market, great team, which is definitely something we can chat about. But I just like gyms. I liked working out. I used to be super into fitness. Unfortunately, now I'm scrawny, you know, punk. But um, I used to be really into fitness and I loved gyms. So I was just like, oh, I'll work with gyms. Because if you can have a level of expertise in the industry you're serving, it separates you from everybody else. Yeah. Like if I can come in and talk Web three with you, mm -hmm. like it, you're like, oh, this guy actually knows his shit. I'm not just talking Facebook ads. I'm talking the ins and outs of your industry, and it builds trust. And trust is the most important thing in persuasion, which is the most important thing in sales. So that's why I chose the industry. 
uh, I just liked it, and I knew a little bit about it. It's called understanding your problem space. Mm. I learned that from Sam Altman. By the way, guys, you can the learn from the guy who made ChatGPT, OpenAI, Y Combinator, thousands of videos. For how free. to start a startup is the best. So I'm so glad you said, bro, I love that. How to start a startup is the best YouTube series. Like this podcast will be good. Hopefully you'll hopefully learn something. But at, at the end of the day, like Sam Altman and the founders of DoorDash and Airbnb, all it's just in free YouTube videos. You get Stanford classes. It's cr free. crazy. From the people who made the biggest companies. YouTube University, brother. I love that. That's important, but that's why we're where we're at 100%. So I'm going to keep saying that on every damn podcast because it's so it. important. But brother, okay. So that's your system for getting real estate clients, uh, like actual results for themselves. Yeah. So uh, go deeper in how you think about getting clients for your agency. You talked about the music video. That's making a creative ad. What is that process? How do you come up with ad creatives? It kind of goes back to OPE in that specific mm -hmm instance of other people's expertise we just went to the video production guy and we had saw an ad he made for an hvac agency so again I real estate that, yeah. real estate rap may sound like a super innovative idea but we saw somebody do it for hvac and we're just like oh what if we made that and we made it better steal and innovate that is the process find other people's ads other people's ads this guy posted it on facebook but you can go to facebook ads library and you can search up basically any industry and you can just go look at the best ads um, there's also things like Turbo Ad Finder, which you can, it's a Google Chrome extension. Uh, you put it into your laptop or whatever, and then you just turn it on. And then instead of seeing posts and shitty distractions on social media, it will just show you ads and you'll just see ads and ads and ads. And you can look at the best ones. You can look at the engagement. You can look at, you know, if they have more views, they've probably spent more money, which means they've probably made more money. And so Turbo Ad Finder, um, Facebook ad library, there's a ton of ways to find ads, but in this case, like I just posted it to social media. My business partner tagged me. He's like, we need that. And I was like, okay, cool. We messaged the guy. He's like, oh yeah, man, I could cook that up for you next day. This guy's insane. Next day, he's just got the full song. And he's like, here it is. I'm like, all right. And then we made the music video. We ran it. Action takers. Yeah. Okay. So there's two, I'm so torn because I feel like I'm conflating the two, like getting clients for your agency and getting clients for your real estate clients. Is there anything else you want to share on actually getting your clients good results? Do you think is really important? You really have to, there's a ton, um, but like you really have to transfer ownership of the outcome to them because if they view you as a scapegoat for their lack of success, they will always be able to say, no, Brett, your lead sucked. Yeah. So if you can, if you can properly transfer ownership of the outcome to them and you actually give them the training they need to be able to succeed and you really, you know, build the hybrid model, then your product, even if they don't succeed, and this happens to us all the time, if a client doesn't win, they're like, yeah, but I saw Sarah Lou winning. So like, I know it's me, guys. I'm sorry. I've been lazy. And they, they don't come to us like the typical agency and say, your leads suck. They come to us and they're like, man, I, I really need you guys to keep me accountable right now. That is such a paradigm shift um, of that industry. So that's all I would say. Transfer ownership of the outcome. To them. Okay. I'm about to get super detailed with you then. Cool. Okay. So you hire, you get a client. They saw your ad of you. Yeah. The music video got their attention. They booked with you. They want to sign up. So fulfillment wise. Yeah. They pay you $8,000 for six months. Then you're running ads for them. Yeah. Are, first off, are the ads you're using the same for every single client? You just changed their name to their logo yep. when you're doing fulfillment? Yep. Okay. And then what is the specific budget that they are? Because they're paying you $8,000 for your yeah. service to run the ads for your yeah. creativity, for your time, all your expertise and whatnot. But then they still have to pay for the ads that you are running. Correct. So what does that model look like? 600 to to $1,000 per month is what they're spending on ads. Um, yeah. Super short answer. Okay, that makes sense though, because it's not that complex. So they have to pay eight thousand. They have to be ex uh, ready to spend six to six hundred to a thousand dollars to even get the clients. Yep. And then you put it. You send them a free course so yep. they can make sure that they're optimized on closing. They know the best practices. Yeah. And that way, you know that it's not you. It's them. If they're yeah. And the course isn't free. It's part of what they pay for. So we're not just selling them leads. It's included. It's included. And then there's we do eight calls per week where in our community, we have multiple coaches, lead industry leaders that come on and you can go and ask questions. They do master classes. We bring on special guests. Um, and we just, yeah, we, we teach them eight times a week. We have live calls. We have a community. We're about to make an inner circle where people can basically the best of the best can go upgrade um, to a more elite coaching and a more inner private um, circle. And yeah, but that's that's the hybrid component. We're doing live calls, live trainings, and we also do one-on-one -on -one meetings occasionally. And this is all because if they, if you don't have that part, probably 
50% of them after that six month period will not sign up again. Dude, the average real estate, this is a crazy stat. The average real estate agency's uh, lifetime span is 61 days. 61 days, two months is the average in our industry. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And so your whole goal is to make sure, like m go above and beyond, make sure they are equipped with the right information so yep. they do get results. Mm -hmm. So you know if you send them leads, they know for a fact that they have the right information. And so you yeah. can really gauge if the leads are quality and then you are focused on them getting better results. So that way they stick around and keep paying you more. Yep. So that's the difference between like a low effort agency of someone who's not going to see success and someone who is doing hundreds of thousands of dollars a month yep. because you are losing less clients. The clients are doing so well that they're actually referring you to their other friends because every real estate agent has four other friends that are real estate agents. Yep. And they're going to tell them how great your service is to the point where they almost get goodwill by recommending you to their friends because you help them and it makes them look good. Exactly. Okay. That that was super well said. And eat your customer's complexity. I'll leave it with that. Eat and your customer's complexity. So is that literally the key to scaling in your mind? Like, no. is, what has been the difference between, what's the difference between a $3,000 a month agency and a $30,000 a month agency than a $300,000 a month agency? Team. Okay. What, 3000 to 30000 is a team? 3000 to 30000 is focusing on the right things and literally just like not jacking off every day. <laughs> like, 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 seriously, it's just like, just do the right thing every day and, and focus on acquisition. Like, as product oriented as I am, one of the most important things I've learned is like, you can't build the product. You can't build the best product if you don't have the most people. Yeah, they're all data. Mm -hmm. And I say that with love for our clients. Like, I literally love these people. But statisticians say, like, you don't have statistical significance until you have at least 100 sets of data. So if you have 10 clients, you don't even have statistical significance yet. You can't make adequate decisions because they're coming from a place of emotion, not from data. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, it's just focusing on how do I get as many clients as possible understanding there will be collateral damage. Some of them might hate you. You might not do great for some of them. That's okay. You can still act and do right by them. And you will eventually learn the secret and the process to a successful outcome. And then you can scale that up. But most of the time, and I was guilty of this, we're too afraid in the beginning. Like we don't want to let anybody down. It's a, it's a deep insecurity, right? We don't want to let anybody down. So we just don't sell anybody at all. Like we'll do a couple free trials and that will be that. But Deep down, we're insecure about our product and we have no conviction. And that is just ruining our ability to actually sell and scale. But in the beginning, zero to 30, zero to 100, honestly, it's just literally setting appointments, closing appointments, mastering sales and focusing on that and not getting distracted in all of the false problems that aren't actually problems, which is, I think, what happens a lot of times. It happened to me five times. Or just focusing and thinking that you need to make your website perfect or this perfect. All that shit. Yeah, all yeah. that shit. Instead of something that just, what's an actionable step moving you forward? Income producing activities. If it makes money, do it. IPAs. I love IPAs. I don't drink alcohol, but I love IPAs when it comes to business. Income producing activities. If it makes money, do it. If it doesn't, don't until you're at 100K a month. Okay. So I want to go to systems. Yeah. Just so we can like outline the funnel really quickly. Yeah. So for your real estate clients, the product you are delivering, you are running an ad. Yep. They click for the home evaluation. Yep. They go to your website from there. Right. A landing page. What are you using to build your landing pages? We use something called high level. Go it's high a level. CRM. Yeah. Okay. And then so you're making them their custom landing page with their branding and the geo mapping with in their location yep. with go high level. And then how do they book the actual in person consultation? They have to call the lead and they also can do it over text. We also have an AI component. The AI can message the leads and actually book appointments for them. That's another kind of unique thing most agencies Twilio? don't have. Yep. Is it Twilio? We use Twilio. That's like the carrier. Um but the AI is something custom built. It's used like dial using Dialogflow, which is Google's uh, software, I think. Okay. But you yeah. just train it on your own data, basically? Yep, exactly. We're in the future, man. Okay. <laughs> so that's it for your client side. Yeah. Okay, now, right? That's, that's base. I mean, sure, there's subtleties, but like that's... Data or whatever, just tracking? That's that's essentially it. Okay, cool. That's the premise. Then for you running ads to get clients, to get yeah. real estate agents to sign up with you, what is your system there and what softwares are you using? So you run a Facebook ad? Well, that's the beautiful thing. It's the same thing. Same. It's, it's go high level. Um, we use, well, we also use Close now, a new CRM that we've been testing, but we, we're running the same ads. We're taking them to a landing page built on the same software. And we're using the same exact system. But are you doing appointment setting and like setters with closers? So yeah, we use setters. We use, I mean, we have, we have setters, we have closers, we have an awesome team. Can you explain um, what a setter and a closer is yeah. important to have too? Yeah. So we actually, we got this tip from 
Hermosi when we were when we were meeting with him. Um, just a nice little nugget he gave us was like, hey, every time you have a lead opt in, have somebody call them immediately and do a triage call. We we're like, interesting. So like have them call the lead, qualify them, see if they can move their appointment up. So if you book from with me for three days out, try to get you to meet with me the same day. That way the interest is high. You don't deal with no shows. So we hired setters, which I don't, I don't like that language, but we hired appointment setters, triage callers who call all of our inbound leads. They qualify them uh, and then they see if they can move their appointments up and then they make sure they're actually going to show up because there's a ton of no shows in this industry. So that's what an appointment setter does. A closer, what we call them is advisors because we are not a marketing company. We are a consulting company. So you're not hopping on a sales call with me. You're hopping on an enrollment call. And if I think you are good enough to join the program, then I will allow you to enroll. And so it's a completely different mindset shift because now it's not this person's going to try to convince me. It's I have to convince this person to be able to buy their product. Psychologically, it's, it's very powerful. So we have advisors, a.k.a. closers, um, and they hop on the Zoom calls and they actually close the deals. OK, let me translate because this is SMMA language. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> people don't know what this means. OK, so he runs a Facebook ad of a music video about real estate agents having problems. And if real estate agents want to get more customers, they click the link on the Facebook ad. Yeah. Then once they click that link, they go to a landing page that talks more about how they can get more clients if they work with this company. These people put their name, email address, and phone number to learn more. Once they click learn more, they have an internal system using Go High Level and Zapier probably. Do you use Zapier? No, we okay. use Make, but we used to use Zapier. I use Make too. Okay, okay. cool. So make.com and Go High Level. And once that person hits enter, they have this person that's called an appointment setter that gets a text message. That's an automation. They hit enter. Yep. This person on their team gets a text message. You have a lead. Here is their name. Call them. And then this person immediately gets that text. And once that person hits enter, they get a phone call from a setter on his team. And yep. this person is there to answer questions, give a little bit of, what is it, uh, pre-qualifying? Yeah. Pre-qualifying. Pre-qualifying. Pre -qualifying. I haven't been in this game in a minute. Pre-qualifying, yeah. telling them a little bit more. And the goal of that setter is to book them an appointment yeah. with a salesperson. But what is genius about him, and the reason I actually booked this interview was because of this exact point, was because you don't call it a sales call. You call it a... Enrollment call. An enrollment call. Why? Again, it's it's psychologically it's different. If I'm booking a meeting with you, Brett, for you to sell me something, like it's it's introductory call for marketing services or something, right? If that's the you come in it defensive when you say exactly. sales call, you you're already looking for reasons to say no because you know it's a sales call. You've been sold before. Most likely you got sold some shit you didn't want to buy, and now you just have an entirely negative connotation to all salespeople. But a coach, an enrollment, an advisor, that's somebody who helps you. That's somebody who helps you make a better decision, which really is what a salesperson is supposed to do, mm -hmm. right? As Hermosi says, the difference between manipulation and I think he says persuasion is intent, mm -hmm. right? So if your intent is good, the salesperson is supposed to actually guide and advise the person. But when you're a salesperson, it, it sometimes can change the intent. So we switch to enrollment um, and advisors and psychologically, it just creates a different vibe. Which is so important and a little detail that no beginner would think about. So yeah. when someone tells you, hey, would you like to book a sales call? No, I'm going to get, no one wants to get sold. Or a free consultation yeah. call. All that no shit's kind of gotten sold. overplayed. It's, call. it's almost like, one, you've been accepted. Two, you're already in it. Yeah. Like you're in the process and you're like, feels like you're moving forward. And so that priming going into the call and the mental attitude going into the call yeah, was like, so, I saw you talk about it on your channel. Matt Shields on YouTube. He talks about all the stuff on his channel. Go follow him. But thank you, dude. That's like that one was like, yeah, that's so clear. Enrollment interview too. I should add on. Interview. It's an interview because it's you haven't earned it yet. So now it's like, it's like oh, I've like I'm trying to get accepted. Oh, exactly. Exactly. You have to prove yourself. Framing. That's the word framing. Yep. That's it is. Genius. It's a frame. Did you like see a conversion rate difference? Like you can quantify. Honestly, we've been doing it for so long. Just I don't know. Yeah. I could. I couldn't give an honest answer to that. That's a really important detail. But yeah. So then, okay. So he has a setter that calls them to try to get them an enrollment call. Yep. Then they're on the enrollment call. That person is trying to get that enrollment call like as soon as possible. Keep the person like interested because yeah. people are in like an emotional state when they see that. If you wait two days, three days, life happened. Their kids were crying. They completely forgot what's this call. I don't care. Yeah. But if you get them while they're like still emotionally strong. They show up to the call. Then you try to sell them and get payment right on that call. Yep. Yep. And then you're closing for six months for $8,000. Yep. And now you have a client. What's the onboarding process? So say they signed up. Yeah. They're down. You got their credit card. They're in. 
This is next? super important because okay. most agencies lose the client. And it doesn't matter if you're an SMMA, by the way. You can be any type of agency. Like this, this is all applicable uh, across different the services. Is selling a service. That's all it his is. Service, his service is at. Is a connector of someone to something else, to someone else. Like that, you're, you're a connector. Um, yeah, in some way. So works for all agencies. The onboarding process is where most agencies lose their customers. So what we do is as soon as somebody pays us money, we call them immediately. We have our head coach, Jake, who's also a real estate agent. I did not mention this. Most agencies, real estate marketing agencies, their account managers are random Joe Smos who worked at a software company, right? And we're account managers. Jake is a coach, not an account manager. Again, important language, language matters. Uh, but he's also a real estate agent. So he speaks the language. So as soon as you pay us that 8K and you start saying, damn, I just paid them 8K. Should I really have paid them 8K? Damn, I kind of want to get that 8K back. I don't know if I... Jake calls you up. And Jake says, hey, man, what made you join the program? And you start thinking of all the reasons you joined. And he says, hey, I'm also a realtor. I've used the program. I've closed $800,000 listings from the system you just paid for. And you're like, oh, okay. I did make the right move. Buyer's remorse is normal. It happens. It's common. Having that first, what we call an ABR, which is just anti-buyer's remorse. It's literally what we call it. It's an ABR call. Anti-buyer's remorse call in the first five minutes. That's super important. That is the most important call is the first one after they've paid you money. So we nail that call. We get them to say all of their buying reasons. Again, we get them excited. We create a tangible goal. What do you want to achieve in the next six months? And then we say, cool, let's work on this together. So now they've reminded themselves why they bought. They've created a goal and they're excited. There's no canceling. There's no buyer's remorse after that. Then we take them into an onboarding call that is 90 minutes long. And we do this in a group setting. So we have usually five to six clients on each onboarding. And we're just for 90 minutes, expectations, expectations, expectations. And it's super important for your team too, because when expectations defer, problems arise. When they think they're going to get something different than what you're actually giving them, that is where people get upset. That's where they cancel in any business. So 90 minutes of just straight, here's what this actually looks like. Here's what you need to do to succeed. Scattered with a ton of testimonials and case studies and social proof. That has helped our retention more than anything else I can talk about. That expectation call, 90 minutes of just straight, here's what you need to do to win. Here's what to expect. If you're not rich after two months, that's okay. Like simple shit, but just reminding them that has done the most for our retention out of anything probably. Again, one of the most important things about running an agency, if you're actually considering an agency, watch that part again. But when people spend $8,000 on a big package, they probably, they might not have talked to their wife about it. They yeah. might not have talked to anybody. It's a big financial investment for these people. They're kind of taking a bet on you that after they yeah. got off that call, they they were in an emotional state, all excited. But then they sit there for a loan, a million thoughts go wild. And so the fact that you call them within five minutes is really impressive. And then you put them through a 90 minute like, is it a group or is it one-on-one? It's a group onboarding. Group we used to do one-on-one, -on -one, but we had to move from one-to-one to one-to-many. -one -to -one -to this is where your community is really interesting for yeah. an agency. Because every agency course has a community, which is I see so much value in. But actually, exactly. But having a, a course or a community for your clients is, like, even smarter. I never thought about that. You Jeez. need a, a mentor, a mastermind, and a skill. Now. Exactly. And, and like, com dude, communities like communities are the few. Like, this is the thing I'm the most passionate about, about a state AI or company is the community because they're, they are primitive. They've been with us for years. Like you thousands of years ago, if you got kicked out of the community, if you did something and got kicked out of the tribe, you literally felt less safe because yeah. now you have to go hunt a woolly mammoth by yourself. <laughs> and it's way harder to kill a woolly mammoth by yourself. Oh, yeah. And so like deeply rooted in our DNA is this idea that we have to be a part of a community in our group in order to survive. So if you could create that feeling for your clients of, if you leave our program, you're leaving a community, there will be an inherent fear of death. Like, I know that sounds extreme, but it's in their DNA, in their psyche, somewhere is this feeling of, I'm not safe if I leave this community. No one wants to get kicked out of a community. It's all subconscious um, and it's all survival. So that's why communities are so important. I heard Emmett Shear, one of the co-founders of Twitch, talk about how community was the most pivotal moment for Twitch to go from like a decent company to what it is today. They built a community. And if you look at a lot of the most successful service-based companies, they all have this. Like the agency communities mm -hmm. you've talked about that I've been in. There were great communities. So why not just build that for another business in a market that's way bigger? There's way more realtors than there are marketing agencies. So that was kind of the thesis behind building the community. When no one around you is doing what you do, you can't relate to their problems. You can't like talk to each other about like how your day was going, what problems yeah. you're facing, how you can solve it.
in, in a community of people that have done it at the same level as you, higher level than you, and they can just tell you, skip this, don't do this, do it this way. And you make friends. You're not canceling a service anymore. You're leaving a friend group. 100%. How hard is that? And uh, something Donald Miller said in his, his book, Building a Story Brand, he says, make your clients the hero of your mission. Make your clients the hero, not your product. And in a community, your clients can literally be the hero by going to somebody and saying, Brett, you're struggling with this. I struggle with this too. Let me help you out. And now it's like they're helping people. They feel more safe because they're providing value and they get, they're getting fulfilled. It's like it's not a fucking Facebook ad agency anymore. It's it's a psychological marathon, dude. It's it's, it's like it's, you're all a team that's trying to help each other grow your exactly. business. Exactly. And exactly. you got each other's backs. You do in real life events yet? Have you ever thought about that? We haven't yet. We do team retreats um, and we've thought about internal doing team internal team retreats, but we haven't done in-person mastermind events yet. Okay. Something we're working on though with the inner circle. That's, that's smart. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. So you sign them up. They yep. get the uh, anti-buyers remorse call. Yeah. Then they get immediately into a group onboarding, kind of yep. like their tribe of their cohort in a way. What else? Are they getting like a packet emailed to them automatically? Good question. They get an automatic voicemail from me, um, which is automated, but it sounds personalized. And then they get a Loom video, which is just like basically a screen recorded, just a normal video, basically. They get a video from my mom um, <laughs> and she says, hey, like I'm one of the clients here. I've used the product, which is true. Like my mom yeah. just closed multiple deals with our system. She says like, hey, just wanted to welcome you. Hope I see you on some of the calls. That video goes out to everybody. Um, that's another really powerful nugget. It's like, what if your clients introduced your service after they pay instead of you introducing it? What if you had a client say, oh, Brett, you joined the inner circle. Dude, you're so lucky to be here. These guys are badasses. I'm a happy client. Mm -hmm. Say, oh, okay, I'm in the right place. Yes. If you just go on here and be like, I'm the best ad buyer in existence. Look at all these ads I've done. Look at all the results I have. You look yeah. arrogant. But if you have someone else say it about you, it's like a whole different effect on people. Exactly. And I love how intentional that was. You're smart. So also another side note, a learning lesson. You chose this because you understood the problem space because of your mom. And so I'm big on like, mm. there is no best business model. It's like, what is the best business model based on your advantages? You, everyone has a unique knowledge network or skill set. And so you need to like, ad, like just be honest with yourself. Do you have like an advantage because you have some in, in your network that can give you an understanding of the problem space. Do you have the experience yourself so you understand the problem space? Or do you have a skill that you're better at than anybody else is that you can leverage to make yourself better than everybody else? So I love that that's how you kind of identified love real estate. That. But let's go into, is there anything else about onboarding? Because I would love to get into how uh, you partnered with someone and that really shot up your success from 30 to 300. Yeah. But was there anything else in onboarding? So you have buyer's remorse call, group onboarding, a packet with testimonials, showing everything they need to know, where everything is. Automatic voicemail and then automatic video. That's basically it. And then they're in the community and this is where you log in to see your results. This is how you track your leads, just educating them on the process. That's all in the CRM, yep. Okay, cool. And that's all automated through make.com and go high level. Basically. Cool. Yeah. Great. If you're really I love how tactical you get. I just have to say, like... I've done this before. Dude, so This I, one I know. Yeah, which is cool because yeah. you, you owned an agency and obviously we talked about that, but I just love how like... This isn't, you know, stories are cool, but like we were talking about, this isn't just like, here's my story. This is like, tactically, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And I love, I love that. I appreciate cool. it, bro. I, yeah. It's just what I'm genuinely interested in too. Yeah. Because I know how much goes into it and you can't just be like, yeah, I run ads and then I get clients. They pay $1,000 a month and now we're at 300K a month. Like, yeah, there's so much nuance in there. That yeah. It's that, like the little subtleties are Let's what get matters. tangible, man. So, but I want to say there is like a big movement for solopreneurship. And I'm a fan, like yeah. cool, like I get it. It's a lifestyle thing. Yeah. But I also think that's for like people that are like in their mid thirties, they work their whole life, <laughs> they have families and they're like trying to optimize for lifestyle. Yeah. I can say personally that I was stuck at around 30K a month, like my best month was 30K in my agency. And then the second I actually met someone who was equally ambitious, my age, equally going out of their way to achieve and had an agency that was a little more successful than mine. When we teamed up, millions, like that. Like yeah. in a matter of months and yeah. so kind of share your story because you've obviously started six of these to get to everything you're teaching right now yeah. but you had to learn each one of these pieces step by step as i referenced earlier and so for you to go 30 to 30 300k you're a big advocate on the quality of people on your team and yeah. some total intelligence of your team is how big your business can be so can exactly. you this is where we can talk about your story yeah. where were you at right before you met your partner how did you meet your partner and what did that do for you yeah And just a quick note on the one-person business model, because I, I kind of have a hot take on it. It really depends on the game you're playing. Are you sprinting or are you marathoning? 
there's a great book called Built to Sell. And it says that every business, whether or not you want to sell it, should be built to sell. And that requires a team. Because if you are doing everything, you don't have an asset. You have a high-paying freelancing gig. That's it. You don't actually have a business. You have a high-paying job. Which can sense. be great. It can, literally can be great. Like, yeah. dude, the guy you had on who was making $1.3 million profit, Insane. badass, keep it going. Insane. But if he ever wanted to exit to where he could do whatever he wanted all day long with his time, he would need to build a team. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's just like I know one day I don't want to have to do anything for anybody. I want to focus on the thing I love every moment of my day. So I built a team. I went through the struggles of that. Way harder, way less fun. But you learn a lot about business and eventually you get the freedom because now I work two hours a week. I don't know if I mentioned that, but like I, I don't do anything. <laughs> like I work two hours a week because we have an amazing team that runs everything. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I just wanted to add that in. As far as my story, where I was I at with my partner? Can I I'll, say one thing on that? Yeah. There is no pride in working hard, in my opinion. Like mm. the goal is there's sprints. Like where like if I need to get my systems down, I need to deliver product, I'll work 16 hours, 18 hours a day. Yeah. But people will come on here and be like, I work 16 hours a day. And it's like kind of like an ego flex thing. I'm like, Dude, I was working it's 70 hours. Signal, in my opinion. It's a that's a really fascinating um note. That's really interesting. You have to work hard. You're not doing things right. Like yeah. in my opinion. That's again you, if you want to be a this is an argument. Definitely work hard. There's a component of it. I mean, for like dude, I was working 70 hours a week for the last 4 years. It's just the last 6 months where now I'm working 2 hours a week. Mm -hmm. So like I want to be clear, like I'm not on my ass like I was hustling you, and I did believe in it. Hard on a the right thing to build a machine that could eventually run exactly. itself. Which is the actual goal, which is what passive exactly. income is portrayed as, but it takes a long time to build yeah. a machine and work. Sorry for cutting you off. No, no, I, I love that. I think that's a great note. As far as where I was before I met my partner, so I've known my now partner, our CEO, Jared, for three years. Um, we actually bought, you know Billy Wilson, obviously. You went to high school with Billy Wilson, which is hilarious because I bought Billy's course. He changed my life. Spent weeks with him at his home in Kansas. Love that guy. Jared, my CEO, also bought that program. Mm. So we met. He was 16 years old. I was 17 years old when we bought the course. Um, and if you want me to touch on like where I was at psychologically and all that stuff before then, I can. Or if you just want me to get into here and we'll go cool from the start in a little bit. Yeah. So Jared ran a fitness agency too. I was running an agency for gyms. So was he. Did you buy a uh, gym launch? No. Okay. No, but that would have been genius. Yeah. That would have been interesting. But no, I never bought Gym Launch. It was like 16K. Mm -hmm. um, I was like, how are they doing this? Yeah. <laughs> so Jared and I both ran marketing agencies for gyms. We knew each other. I was doing like 20K a month profit and he was doing like 3K. He was doing 15K a month, but he was doing like 3K a month profit. We went over our books with each other and I was just like, this kid knows nothing, bro. Like I'm, I'm doing 20K a month profit. He's doing 3K a month profit. Well, he's dumb, but he was putting everything back into the business. And Jared is a genius at this. He he did not care about short term short short term income because he was running the marathon, and he was thinking long term. Jeff Bezos' first letter to shareholders ever. It's all about the long term. That was the title. It's all about the long term. Seventeen years later, he becomes the richest man on the planet. Jared did not care about how much he could make and flex on a YouTube video, which I've been guilty of. I have to admit. He cared about how much he could learn to build the best business possible. And so he put everything back into the business and he bought Joel Kaplan's mastermind and he bought all these courses and he bought all these high performance coaches. Like he just invested everything. And then COVID happened. My agency crashed to zero because it worked with gyms. His agency crashed to zero because he worked with gyms. But he was in Joel Kaplan's inner circle. He was in all these different places. He had all this information that he paid for and he, he sacrificed his income for information and he scaled 100K a month in an e-com niche during COVID because that's what was selling is digital products, right? Because everybody went from in-person to online. And he built an agency to 100K a month in six months. And I crashed to zero. And I was like, man, maybe this kid did know something I didn't know. And so Jared and I have been friends ever since. He, he exited that agency. He did not know how to build product, if I'm being very honest. His product and customer service, from what I heard, sounded like a mess. But I could get up to 20K, 30K a month and I would be stagnant because I knew how to deliver product, but I didn't know how to sell. I didn't have the infrastructure for marketing. That's what Jared was great at. So when I saw Estate AI, it actually wasn't mine. It's an agency that Jared and I acquired because I was running a Facebook ad agency for Facebook ad agencies. So I was running a white label agency, which you'll understand, but essentially that's just a, an agency that does the actual fulfillment for another agency. Yeah, so... Oh, you would do the fulfillment? Like you would run the ads? Yeah, like let's say you run an agency for gyms and you went and sold a client, but you didn't know the first thing about You're service like, delivery. Exactly. Yeah. 
You didn't know how to actually run ads for gyms, so you came to my agency. I ran the ads in your name and said, oh, this is Brett's company. Actually, it was us. You sold the clients. We did the back end. That's what I was doing after my gym agency failed. So, if you want to learn about that, Iman, that's what Iman Gaji's course is kind of about. So like Facebook ads yeah, or? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, actually, I did not know that. Okay. And so, yeah. So we were running a white label agency and we were partnering with different agencies. One of them was a company um, called VZM and they ran ads for realtors. And we were the ones actually doing the ads. That was a state AI. But at the beginning, it was just VZM. And I saw this guy who... I really liked him as a person, but he was kind of a new agency owner, mm -hmm. but he just kept getting new clients week after week. And he didn't really know that much more than any of the other agencies, but he was taken off and he was just like, I don't know what's happening. I was like, dude, why are you scaling so much? He's like, I don't know. I was like, that's a sign. He doesn't even know why he's having the mu as much success as he is, <laughs> but he's crushing it. So I said, dude, do you want to like partner up? And he was like, I was going to ask you the same thing because I don't know how to run ads. And so I was like, cool, let's partner up. I take 50% in the in the company, but I'm not really doing anything. I'm just like, I'll be your product guy. Then I run into Jared and Jared's like coaching agency owners at the time. He exited his e-com agency and he's just kind of burnt out looking for the next thing. And I'm like, Jared, you should come into this real estate agency with me and we should scale this thing up. He's like, bro, I fucking hate realtors. <laughs> That's what he said. He was like, I hate realtors. It's a terrible niche. Churn sucks. They're all broke. Yeah. The lead quality sucks. All these things that every agency owner says. He was like, it's a terrible niche. I was like, bro, we're getting like 10 yeah. clients a month. Nobody's canceling. It's, I don't know what's going on. You got to check this out with me. And it's a huge market. And that is a key. It was a huge, huge market. And uh, eventually Jared calls me back a week later and he's like, you know what? Let's do this. He joins the Slack. Jared and I partner up. We go from 10K a month to 150K a month in 90 days. And it's been history ever since. So, the reason I partnered with Jared, which I think is important, is he was incredible at sales and marketing. He had a skill that I do not have. I did not have. And again, I'll quote Hermosi. I don't know if this is his original quote, but clearly I'm a connoisseur of his content. One of the things he says, you should only partner with somebody if they have the skills you don't have, the money you don't have, or the time you don't have. Jared had the skill that I did not have. And so we partnered up. I did all the product, all the back end. He took over the sales team, brought in a ton of closers, raised the price, did all the fun, fancy front end stuff. And we scaled. Fatal mistake is partnering with the person that's most convenient or like a friend from that you grew up or with. Or that you like the most. Yeah, that you like the most. Fatal mistakes. And you'll learn eventually. A hundred percent. I think we all, we've all learned. <laughs> and another big thing about partnerships is like the best companies, and if you read Good to Great, amazing business book by Jim Collins, one of the things they talk about is leadership teams need to autopsy results without blame or bias. Interesting. Autopsy results without blame or bias. So Jared and I, Jared was on the debate team in high school. He fucking loves to debate and I hate it, but we debate everything. And the reason is because I've had partnerships like this where I'll go to them. I'll say, hey, here's my idea. And I'll say, oh, that's a great idea. Let's do it. Oh, here's my new idea. Oh, that's a great idea. Let's do it. Oh, I think that's a bad idea. Oh, you're right. That's about. And they just would agree. And they were just yes men. And I was like, I don't even need them as a partner. Jared and I is the exact opposite. I'm like, Jared, I think we should do this. And he literally looks for reasons to say no. But it's actually good because then we know we're only actually doing the right things. And that's what the most successful companies do is they autopsy the results. They don't care who was right or wrong. They look for what is objectively the right thing to do. That is such a good way to frame. I've never thought about that way. Have you ever done psychedelics? You don't have to. Dude, I'm literally... We're, bro, I said, God, give me a sign that I'm supposed to do psychedelics tomorrow. And now he asked me if I, that's we're exactly, supposed to do it tomorrow in Sedona. That's exactly... A great choice, but <laughs> that's exactly what it does. It allows you to separate your ego and your identity from wow. decision making. And so, like, you can get in a feedback loop, like, this is the right business, this is the right business, this is the right decision. Yeah. And then you can just do that. And it's all of a sudden, your ego and identity is completely separated from your own decision making, where you can criticize that, like, objectively and laugh at yourself. Dude. So, if you're ever in a rut, that's like the key. That is so interesting. And, and I'm, def I'm definitely doing it's it now. To like that. I would not be surprised. Yeah. I'm literally, uh, I'm, I'm going to do them tomorrow now because you said that, but it's interesting. Like most of the things we don't know stem from fear of admitting that we don't know them. Like, like most of the things we think are wrong. It's, I think Mark Twain has a quote. It's not what you know. Quote you guys. Yeah, dude, I'm from fucking quote book at the end of the day. Um, he says something like it's, it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you think, you know, that just ain't so. And it's our ego that keeps us in thinking things. That aren't true. And it's it's ego. It's the self-protection. But 
Uh, I love that. So everybody do shrooms. No, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Okay. So with that being said, I did want to ask, you said you're 50, 50. How did you guys, how do you guys make decisions if you both like, disagree? That is a great question. He is CEO and he technically has last say, which sucks. Cause I'm the founder. And like, say, I, or more say. he has the final say, final say. Yeah. Because he is CEO. I've well, given, that's agreed upon. I, and I've given him that responsibility and we have never really actually had a problem there. He has made decisions that he did without my knowing or like things on the front end that he just, you know, basically was like, oh, I didn't need to tell you about it because it's the front end. I go to him for every decision I make. He goes to me for like some of the decisions he makes. So there's definitely a problem there. And I've just had to accept like I made him CEO because he was willing to take on the responsibility and take ownership over the entire team, which I didn't want to do. So like. I have to accept the fact that he's going to make some decisions without me. And I just have to kill my ego there and say, you know what? You made a decision without me. Let's talk about it. So much of good partnerships is just not trying to be the bigger person. 100%. Because you could like get to this route where you think that you, like it can become an ego thing where like you make this decision and it's, it becomes personal. And it's like, now you're trying to win an argument regardless of logic. Cause it's your, like it's your side versus their side not about what's best for the business. Yeah. So me and my partner, I think I'm the one that like has like final say for the yeah. most part, but in our uh, partnership agreements, it's always, if it comes down to it, flip of a coin. Yeah. Like if it's like, if you want to like ch to death, die on the sword, we just flip a coin and just have to deal with it. Interesting. And so that's in every operating agreement we have. That's an interesting framework. I kind of like it. I can just challenge him to a battle and yeah. he gets heads, I get tails. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. Contract. I think it's important, especially because partnerships can go wrong. I know you talked about like get everything in writing and get partnerships down pat. Please. But we can save that one for another, another day. Time. Yeah. <laughs> so again, let's go into team. How You said you have, he manages the team. How big is your team? Well, I, I manage the back end. He manages the yeah. front end. But he's ultimately CEO. So like he has the final say and stuff like that. Okay. So first off, just objectively, how many people are on your team? Contractors and full-time employees. Just Everybody's one full-time. Everyone's like 17, full 17 people. Okay. What? Okay, 17 people. Wow. Yep. And they're all full-time employees, yep. W-2? Yep. Um, no. W-9. W-9, and then some are uh, it's like 88 Ben or something. Which okay. Is so okay, interesting. Okay, so then let's go through what in order do you hire for an agency that's scaling? What in order do you hire? That is a good question. I heard Layla say, I'll just keep quoting them because they're, I mean, you learned from somewhere. There's no original um, thought. It's 100% true. <laughs> it's just about, like, can you actually grasp the thoughts that are being taught? Because, like, you can listen to this podcast and then go out and, like, not follow any yeah, decisions you've learned. So one of the things Layla, um, I heard her say, because she's a genius with hiring and management, is you want to hire for the thing that you hate the most and you're the worst at. Like, start with high offloading those things because they're probably draining the most of your energy. Yeah. So... If you're a sales-oriented person, hire somebody to run the ads. Hire somebody to talk to the clients. Hire for also what is the biggest problem right now, time-wise. What is taking up the most of your time? Because if you can free your time, you can go work on the most important thing in the business, which is going to be generating revenue and attracting more team members. So just hire for what is taking up the most time right now. Like it, any agency I'm talking to or working with, because I'm starting to take equity in some, it's like literally if you're looking to hire people, what is the thing you're spending the most time on right now? That's the framework we use. So when you're first starting out, you're by yourself, you just put, you have to do everything, all 10 things. You have yeah. to come up with the ad, make the ad, run the ad, do the setting, do the sales call, do the onboarding, do the expectation management, yeah. and then actually end up fulfilling. Yeah. And so just identify out of what part of those steps you do not enjoy the most, and then find someone. How do you find someone? Great question. We are big fans of recruiters. Recruiters? Money loves speed. We like to just give people money, save the time, and find people fast. Uh, the philosophy, I call this hmm. eight figure philosophy, but like, this is the thing, this is the backbone of our company. Never stop selling, never stop recruiting. Like, and you do that all the way to, I think you can probably get to a million dollars a month. I haven't done it myself, but I think you can get to a million dollars a month. Never stop selling, never stop recruiting. And through one channel? For recruiting, for selling, no, I think you need multiple acquisition channels to get to a million a month. For recruiting, you can recruit. I mean, your recruiters can recruit on a ton of channels. Of we just pay a recruiter. And uh, we basically have them on payroll and they find the people for us. They bring us amazing candidates and we just do the interviews and go from there. We sacrifice our money for time. How much do you pay a recruiter? Um, we get a good deal. 
but like 4,500 for a CSM or a salesperson, usually it's like 10K. So it's basically just 10K per person they find you essentially. For English, like for US based front end people, yes. For overseas employees, we can get team members placed for $1,500, which is mm. pretty good. And that's just a flat fee you pay them. Yep. Hmm, cool. Yep. I've never done that. Oh, that's interesting. It, it helps so much. It also depends on the nature of your company. Yeah. If you're like a really niche company of a small amount of people, it may make sense to hire from network, especially with the leverage you have in your brand. Uh, but when you're like an agency and you can train people yeah. from the ground up, it's a little less niche. It just makes sense to have a recruiter find the people for you. Yeah, there's not many. Our industry is very new. <laughs> so there's not a ton of like established people or companies that you can recruit from. Yeah. And yeah, my network definitely helps. Um, okay, so 17 people. Wow, that's really, what's the, what roles? Is it like four setters, five salesmen? Is that like the bulk of it? Or? So we have three salespeople. We have a sales manager. We have one setter right now. So three sales, oh, one, setter, wow. one sales manager, one setter. We have a wizard who's basically an automation specialist, kind of like an ops manager, but just the automation side. They don't do some of the other operational things you have to do. Then we have a head coach, uh, we have two customer success reps below the head coach. We have three media buyers, and then we have an executive assistant. And the head coach, Should customer be. success, those are all like the community coaching calls, calling them Talking after like a month. Are you everything going okay? How's your experience? Basically, email support, all that. Okay, gotcha. Cool. Yeah. That's a good structure, bro. That's the breakdown. And 250 to 300K a month. So is that... What channels are you using to get clients? Is it, is it solely Facebook ads and Instagram? Facebook, ads? Instagram, referrals. Referrals. TikTok ads as well and Google. okay so this is something i want to just nail because it's so crucial to your business and i also want to talk about your uh finding your franchises how that helped you at the beginning mm. so making a good product is how you get referrals essentially yeah but is there a referral structure you have is there a fee you're paying and then go into the actual franchise how you found franchises as well yeah another really good question referrals we incentivize your clients to give you referrals because you're going to pay to acquire a customer anyway. You might as well just pay your clients to do the acquisition for you because their referrals make better clients and they're easier sales. So we pay our clients um, 33% recurring for life of anybody they refer. Lifetime value, 33%. Damn. Yep. That's yep. really good. You, dude, you could, make, you could make six figures just referring, referring people yeah. to state AI. So if you know some realtors, connect us, 33% recurring for life. Referrals. For real. That's crazy. Um, at the gym agencies, what we did was two referrals equals a free month. Mm. And people love that. Yeah. We had one person refer us 12 clients. They got <laughs> six free months and they gave us 12 clients. It was a no-brainer. I'd do it every time. That's like basically just a side hustle for them at that point. For real? So yeah. when it comes to ref asking for a referral, at what stage are you asking it? Like, are you waiting until you get them like a result for a month? Dude. I love that you know the space because like, it, it, I feel like those questions are, are super... If you, uh, if you close asking. them today and then ask them tomorrow, like I feel like yeah, it's like so rude. <laughs> yes, but also that's what I used to think. And now it's like as soon as your client has a win, you want to ask them to upsell into your higher level program if you have one. Like the first win. If it's big enough, yes. Nice. Yeah. Um, like we joined Cole Gordon's inner circle and like in the first, like I don't know, month they were like yo join the boardroom like and it's like that's how you should do it so that as, makes sense. That as, makes sense. as soon as they get a win um you want to get a testimonial a, a, a success interview saying good things about your product and service you want to ask them who they know you want to get a written review on google if you can um and then you want to upsell them into whatever thing you want because you've gotten them to say good things you've asked them who they've known so they put your their name on the line for you now that now is the perfect time to try to upsell them into a higher level program as soon as the iron is hot that's when you want to strike right like as soon as there's momentum capitalize on that cuz that's when like the start of a relationship you're excited and now you're starting to see some results and like oh this thing's awesome like that's when you want to strike and you want to get uh, testimonials referrals all that stuff how do you know that they got their first win community helps because we do okay so this is another little uh, I guess, nugget for agency owners. We do something called the agent lottery. So every time a client posts a win in our Facebook group, our private group, they enter a ticket into the agent lottery. And in the agent lottery, that is genius, in the bro. agent lottery, we give away uh, commercials, like the custom mm -hmm. songs, but you actually get to be in the ad. We're flying <laughs> somebody out to be in the ad with us. We're taking That's them out fun. to dinner. It's just fun. Yeah. And we're also giving them a free month of the company. We're a free ticket to our first in-person event, a, for, a free VIP ticket. Um, and then there's like other things we give away. So every time you enter a ticket, we're giving away like $40,000 worth of stuff. And it's a six-month challenge, which is pretty long. I'd recommend doing it for like 
60 days, not six mm-hmm. months. But we do the agent lottery. Anytime somebody posts a win, they get a ticket entered and then we raffle it off. So give your clients an incentive to want to share their wins. Our Facebook group is just full of people crushing it. Crushing, like a couple of days ago, we had a client say, got a $1.2 million listing from you guys. Two hours later, another client got a $1.6 million listing from you guys. Three few hours later, one of our OGs they make, closed 16 deals from you. They make so much money off it's of that too. insane. Wow. It's insane. And so now also what that does is psychologically, all people are ever seeing from your company is wins. <laughs> How can they go to you and say your product doesn't work? Right. They just saw 40 people get wins and enter the agent lottery. So that's that's another thing we do. Um, I forget where I was going with that, but that's another. No, but that's such a, that's like for that's community building like tactics right there. Because yeah. people look at a community. There's like one post a day, two posts a day, and it's like I can't get this to work. It's all tech support. People are like gonna just have low energy. Oh, it's painful. But if you are incentivizing, saying like, hey, if you share your win, you're entering this lottery to get an ad, cash, whatever it is. Exactly. Now everyone is just putting their. All wins they want to do is share wins. It just because community is like a living, breathing organism, or like hmm. growing a plant. You know, like if you let it die, it's dead but it's a momentum game yeah just like an agency scaling in that sense as well that's cool that's really smart and really clever that's non-obvious to a lot of people you never you don't see those in smna courses a lot of the time until you're advanced so moving on that's really good insight thank you um i just want to go through just one last time like just objectively what are the your tech stack or what are all the different softwares and automations you use just list them all okay so slack for team communications. Yep. Stripe for payment processing. So what do you do for if you want to accept payment? What's that process for the 8,000? We just get their card. We put it in Stripe. You just write down their card number? We, we our closers, our advisors have access to Stripe. So they can just put the card info straight in. Straight into Stripe. Straight Not into like a Stripe. pay funnels or anything. Nope. Okay. Straight into Stripe. Um, we used to do pay funnels. Just Stripe's easier for us. So Stripe. Slack for team communication, high level for CRM management internally and externally. Close for internal CRM managing leads and prospects. Close? Close. It's like close.io. Hmm, never heard um, of it. Pretty cool software from what I heard. Honestly, I don't need <laughs> it. Sales team does. Facebook group, um, make.com for automations, a little bit of Zapier. There's probably some other stuff I'm missing, but like that's the main That's the What main was your tech, tech message provider? Twilio is connected to high level. So okay. if you just use high level, Twilio will be embedded okay. in that. Yeah. Go high level's grown so much. Dude, I was I was on the ClickFunnels era. Dude, I was the three I was like the three hundredth person in high level like four years ago when nobody knew what high level was. I came across it and I was like, this is gonna change the game. And I was like, I didn't even want to tell anybody about it. Because they like, almost optimized it. for SMA in a way. They did. They were an agent. Sean yeah. Clark, the CEO, um, he was an agency owner. That's like, why the funnel it. stayed broad for like any funnel. They like specifically went into like every solution for your agency. Yeah. And now people are making bank on their like affiliate their affiliate program. Dude, I know I know the number one high level affiliate, Thomas Gannett. I don't know if you know Thomas. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not. I won't say how much he makes, but let's just say he's like 20 years old and he's making fucking bank. Just literally referring GH. I've heard so many stories of that like the last two or three months. It's crazy. It's interesting. Because they give 40% lifetime. Lifetime. It's Life. insane. And they have a high ticket service. Yeah. It's really interesting. It's a new, whole new world. Sean Clark is an incredible CEO, by the way. Just like product focused to the core, customer obsessed. Everything we've talked about, he embodies and that's a huge reason High Level's been so successful. Okay, well, I'll check him out. Yeah. Huh, interesting. All right, so I think that, I think I fully understand your your agency i think i know how you run ads for your clients how you get results for your clients what you focus on to make sure you're getting a good product i think i understand how you get clients how you fulfill your process pretty clearly so yeah you seem like a really smart guy you're really well read you're really well educated but you said that you dropped out in ninth grade yeah i don't know if i could say legal like i I don't even know if that's legal (laughs) i don't know if i could say well educated so i'll tell you how i finessed but not formally educated not formally educated I'll tell you how I finesse the education system completely. And I've never heard anybody say this, but it's not. So I dropped out of ninth grade to my parents' dismay and uh, disgruntledness. And it was very difficult. But I, I left after ninth grade. And I, I can talk about why. But to talk about finessing the education system, I went and I did classes online. Like before it was cool. Before COVID was a thing. I just did online programs. Before before it was cool. Um, so my senior year of high school, I, I did this thing called Penn Foster. It's a company. It's a school. You can look it up. I went to Penn Foster and my senior year, I finished two full semesters, six full credits in three days. Any, bro, anybody yeah. can go do that right now. Do it's that. Complete finesse. <laughs> do that. Finish the entire, like get your diploma, 
you could like you could finish four years of school in a week. How crazy you'd be fourteen years old sitting just like I'm all right. so mad in high school. Like all the time. Like this is such a waste of time. So yeah. slow. I'm here seven hours. Yeah. Why? So I left after ninth grade and then I did online and I realized you could finesse. Um uh, my senior year, I I I guess my senior year, I graduated early. I bought Billy Wilson's course. At I, what age? Hus- I was seventeen. Seventeen. So I finished in three days. Um, I had bought Billy's course actually a couple weeks before that, and it was just, it was really interesting, man, because I remember going to my mom and saying, like, I'm not going to college, and I'm buying this course, and I want to build a marketing agency, and I also needed her to pay for half of it, because I couldn't afford the course, and I remember telling her that, like, sitting her down at the kitchen table just like this and saying like, mom, I'm going to buy this course. I'm not going to college. And she just like freezes and then she starts crying. And I just see like these tears well up inside her. And she's just like, Matt, like, please go to college. She was so worried for me. And I was like, mom, like, I just need you to trust me. I just need you to take this. But like, and I stopped convincing her. I was just like, you know what? I don't care what I have to do. I will never see that look on my mom's face again. I will never see that look on my mom's face again of fear and and disbelief and, and just, I don't care what I have to do. Now my mom's a client. She's wanted to be a business partner of mine. Love her to death. We've grown a, a great relationship, but she was so scared of me not going to college and buying this course and going in this digital route that it gave me the fuel I needed to just say, I don't care what the fuck I have to do. I'm going to make this work. And if I didn't have that motivation, I probably wouldn't have worked so hard to try to succeed with this. So uh, that that was a, a pivotal moment for me was talking to her and saying, hey, I want to buy this course and her just literally crying in my face. And then just three hours later, I go to my brother. I'm walking upstairs. He's like, so, man, what colleges are you applying to? And I'm like, oh, dude, actually, I, I'm going to do SMMA. And he bursts out laughing, bro. <laughs> my brother and I have obnoxious laughs. So he's just like, <laughs> like literally laughing like a high pitched girl. And he's just like, SMMA. And I'm like, fuck. And I just, I felt so bad, dude. I was like, my mom doesn't believe in me. My brother's laughing at me. My friends are making fun of me. Like shit was so, I remember I went to the gym one time with this girl that I had a crush on and she walks up to me. I'm 17 at the time. I dropped out of school. So I was like homeschooled. So I was like a fucking loser in a lot of people's (laughs) eyes. And I remember I go to the gym with this girl I liked and she walks up out of her car. And the first thing she says to me, like, doesn't say hello or anything. She just says, what are you doing? Like, what do you mean? We're about to work out. She's like, no, like, what are you doing? You're 17. You don't have a car. You don't have a license. You don't go to school. You're not going to college. You don't have a job. What are you doing? I was just like, what the fuck am I doing? I was like, I got to prove people wrong. And I, I'll be honest, proving people wrong was the single biggest source of motivation that I ever had. Now, what's honestly really weird is people believe in me and now I have to prove them right. And it's way less mm-hmm. motivating than proving them wrong. Mm-hmm. So it's been fascinating for me, but that's part of what pushed you, me so hard. Into have you seen Michael Jordan's The Last Dance? Yeah. Like he just finds reasons to like make things personal for no reason, for that reason. Dude, a competitor. Michael Jordan, I have some crazy Michael, I met Michael Jordan. Um, I met Michael that's Jordan cool. because I, <laughs> yeah. Um, I lived in Charlotte. I lived you in Charlotte. Team, right? I played basketball my entire life. I played at the Jordan Brand Classic, which is a high school event where he, he gave our entire AAU team shoes and like signed them. And, Dope. Yeah. So I met Michael and I started looking into him and like, Dude, some of the shit he did is insane. Psychopathic. Dude, he went he went to one of his teammates' houses to play cards with him and his grandma. His teammate got up and like went to the bathroom and Michael cheated in the game to beat the grandma, bro. And he like he didn't tell the grandma. He cheated in a card game against a grandma. That's psychopathic. It's cool because it's Michael Jordan, but bro, if I did that to your grandma, you'd be like, Matt, get the <laughs> fuck out of here. You need some serious leverage in that. Yeah. To pull that off. Crazy, but that's that's a competitive. That's a funny story. story. That's yeah. a funny story. Okay, so I will say I'm gonna shout out Dan Co here. Do you know who that is, Dan? Yeah, Coe? yeah, yeah. I love his like spirituality, but he put me on this thing called uh, like the nine stages or seven stages of ego development. Mm. It's actualize.org. It's like six hour long podcast of like the stages of your ego development, mm. and so it's like the pre conventional, the conventional stages of your ego, where people at that stage are literally incapable of like thinking that their worldview is wrong. And so when you're constantly, as a high schooler kid, being told by your parents and everyone around you, your ego is only developed to a phase where if you're not doing that one path that everyone is saying is the right path, 
you genuinely to your core believe that mm. anyone doing things differently are wrong to the point where you're like scared and you need to like try to protect them. Yeah. And so it's interesting to slide the exact same story as a kid. Like yeah. I always felt different. I always felt like no one was like taking me serious. I had like big ambitions. This, I was like, this can't be right. Like we're wasting all our time. We're not learning shit. And so I love that you like had the balls internally to drop out, finish school fast, and then stand up to your parents. And I will say one more thing, because I know a lot of kids relate to this. Like your mom is only viewing you off of signals that you're sending her based on your performance because she's at her job, she's not with you at school. And when she's seeing that you're like not doing well in school, you're dropping out in her mind, like what's wrong with him? Is he like doing drugs? Is he like, not like what could I do better? Because they like take it account, like their accountability. What could I be doing better to help him go on the right path? But any person that wants extraordinary results will be in that position that you're in and have to stand up for themselves over their parents at some point. Yeah. So what gave you the courage to even go against them and do that? Or to tell them before you even started. I was too scared to tell my parents. Like yeah. I just did it and I was like, if I make 10K a month, then they'll like, they can't say anything. So I did it silently while going to school and wasting a ton of money yeah. in college. Honestly, man, it wasn't courage at all. Like the reason my mom cried, this is like the real explanation of the story. Age 15 to age 17, I had given up on life. Like after I dropped out of school, like I, every day I woke up, I just hated life. And that is the most ignorant thing I will ever say. I admit it. It's the dumbest thing I could ever say, but I hated waking up. Did you have a reason, like a core like thought? I had, so I had, I was diagnosed with anxiety, depression, and OCD. Mm. The big three, as I call it. And it crippled me. Like I, I couldn't walk into a grocery store. My anxiety was so bad. Like somebody might judge me or something. I couldn't talk to people. So just for like reference, like that is, that that's the shift you can make as a human being. Go from not being able to talk to people to being able to lead a team of 17 people and hundreds of clients. Like that is what I'm fascinated with more than anything else is what is the transformation you can make as a person on this planet? What are, what are you capable of achieving by transforming your mind? Because that is the greatest superpower we have. So like I was in a completely dark place. I, I had been going to therapy for years. I wasn't making progress. My life was pitiful and I had probably the lowest self-esteem of anybody you would ever meet ever and my mom knew that and she had watched me go through all of this and she was just so worried and she didn't know what to do nobody did they gave me fucking pills they gave me all this bullshit nobody knew what to, no, knew what to do and entrepreneurship was like the one thing that gave me hope that maybe I can actually go and make money and all this proving wrong that I think I can do I can leverage it in a way that makes me financially free and so when I discovered entrepreneurship it was like it was the only thing that gave me hope that maybe I can actually overcome all of this and become free. And it's the best thing I ever did and fucking saved my life. And I'm extraordinarily grateful. I love to psychoanalyze. And so have you been able to like now that where you're at now with perspective, your brain's more developed and like awareness. Have you been able to like look back and try to understand what was tricky? Because anxiety is like, in my opinion, maybe this is completely wrong and you stand up for yourself if this is the case. But in my opinion, anxiety, OCD or depression, maybe not OCD, but depression is like triggered because of your circumstance that you're in and you are like out of control and you can't, you feel like you can't control that situation and you're just in a bad loop. So do you think that the fact that you were being put into a system that wasn't designed for your personality type was like the reason that you were feeling anxiety and depression? Or do you think that you actually, like, there's like a brain chemical mismatch Great question. genuinely? Because I think one last thing. Yeah. Because doctors will just prescribe in America, just prescribe you an extremely dangerous drug to change your brain chemistry to they, fix it. And they did Instead that. of trying to change your environment first. And they did that. Which is it's like everybody wants to give, give the solution to the problem but nobody everyone wants to give like the the band-aid to the problem but nobody wants to figure out like how do you actually heal the wound or identify what the problem actually it, like how did it, how did it come about and like they gave me like lorazepam or some bullshit and they're like oh you won't feel depressed anymore they were right i felt like a fucking zombie though mm -hmm. i didn't feel anything i just was like walking around like i don't feel anything for six months so looking i thought about this so much like why was my anxiety so bad why was i so depressed and i think a lot of it is yes, being in an environment that I just didn't fit into, 
think a lot of it is rooted in the programming that happens from age zero to age seven. My parents got divorced when I was six. And I think subconsciously, I maybe I somehow right. blamed myself and I've always had like some core, like lower self-esteem because of that, because I felt mm -hmm. like I was the reason my parents got divorced. But consciously, I don't think like that at all. Like, yeah. I'm glad they got divorced. It's way better that way. So I don't know exactly what it was. Um, but I know one thing for sure is I was anxious and depressed and sad because I was trying to be somebody that I wasn't because I was trying to fit into a box that I couldn't. I was like a fly trapped in a jar going like banging its head from side to side, trying to figure out how do I get out of this? It just went crazy. And then entrepreneurship for me was realizing that the lid was off the jar the entire time and I could just fly right up. And like for me, I just, yeah, I just, I was trying to fit into a box that I didn't fit into that caused me to be somebody I wasn't. So of course I was anxious. I was faking. I wasn't who I actually was. Of course I was depressed. And the Bible says anxiety causes depression within a man. So the anxiety created the depression and the anxiety was created because I was trying to be somebody that I wasn't. And it's because I overvalued myself. And I thought things were more important than they actually were. Like my biggest thing to share is you are going to die. None of this actually fucking matters. Don't take yourself so seriously. Mm -hmm. And if I could have done that back then, I would have been able to be free. Like mm -hmm. who cares if somebody says, dude, your podcast sucked. Your information, you, I don't like it. Who cares if somebody says, oh, you're a terrible business. Like who cares? You're going to die. None of this is, this is all made up, bro. All the cameras, everything. It's just made, it's a game. It's a game that we get to play, but I was taking myself way too seriously. And uh, it fucked me up. Yeah, I think you have to live by a moral ethical code at that Agreed. point. And then you can rest easy at night from there. And it's kind of just what you're referencing is the Albert Einstein quote. Like if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it's going to live its whole life thinking it's stupid or that's whatever. Like, talk about yeah. quotes, man. Yeah. I love that. I got some myself. I love that. It's but good. that's just like the system that most people are put on. And on top of that, it's like pre-puberty, puberty. You're all going through this different transformation. You're in a small like social status circle. And if you're not thriving in that social status circle, that's how humans like judge their performance in life yeah they're you're obviously going to have a horrible time i was very sad in middle school and high school yeah for that exact reason but you seem to be going through a lot different like a, like a lot harsher so once you got out of that system and then you told your mom you finally made that say, like statement i'm not going to college i'm going to do this did you feel like was that when the lid was opened and you found the way to go through did that like open the doors that was the to first, like feeling free that was the first time in years that i had hope like that was the first time in years I woke up with like, hey, maybe I, because my plan was like, after I turn 18, everybody's going to go to college. I won't be able to live at home anymore. And like, that's when I'll have to take my own life. And like, that was my plan for three years is like, this is over. This is miserable. And like, I, ca I can't even begin to try to comprehend how I used to think that was the option for me. Like that was the best solution of my life was to end it. So when I saw entrepreneurship, yeah, it gave me hope for the first time. And now I'm wake up every day and I'm just like, and Nick can attest to us, attest to this because we're both the same way. Like, I'm just fucking grateful every breath I get to take. I walk outside, I see the sun. I'm like, how fucking lucky am I just to be here? And um, entrepreneurship, 100% was the the reason for that. Yeah. So I, entrepreneurship isn't necessarily fun or easy, like directly the tasks you have to do. Yeah. It's not instant gratification. You have to come up with an idea for an ad, make an ad for a week, wait for the editor. You have to learn the systems, take a course, do all this. It's not easy. So obviously it was more gradual than just like today, I'm gonna to start being an entrepreneur and now you had hope, but the hope was building and you saw an opportunity that you got excited about and then you could see results kind of. Yeah. So what was like your actual process from like the day you started your entrepreneurship journey? You took, did you buy, you bought Billy's course, Bought Billy's right? course. So, what was like some of the key points that like you actually started making positive movement forward? I had to get over my fears. I had to get over the anxiety. I had to start cold calling. Cold calling was a mental fucking tug of war challenge for me. And that was like, I remember the first cold call because I've, oh, dude. Yeah. Especially terrifying. when you have like literally diagnosed anxiety and OCD, like I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm the 15 minutes. Uh, Cause this is how OCD works. It sucks. I, I don't speak it over myself anymore. I no longer have OCD. Fuck that. But when I did, I was I was like dialing the number for 15 minutes straight and then deleting it all and then dialing again and deleting it. I'm like 15 minutes it took me to make my first cold call. You know what's hilarious, bro? I called a guy and it was the best cold call I've ever had till this day. I was sweating. I was shaking. I was so nervous. And he's like, so like, did you buy a course or something? That is a gym owner. I cold called a gym owner in Virginia. And he's like, did you buy a course or something? I was like, yeah. He's like, 
whose course did you buy? I was like, Billy Wilson. He's like, Billy? I know Billy. This fucking random gym owner in Virginia was in an inner circle with Billy in a mastermind with him. And we hit it off. We had a great conversation. And that showed me these fears are just false evidence appearing real. And it's not anything that can actually hold me back. And I realized like this is all made up in my fucking mind. This life, there's there's another side to every fear that I have, which is the reality of it, which is actually something beautiful. And I had a great conversation that I was terrified of. I was terrified of calling and then I ended up having a great outcome. So I started to reshape my mind into realizing what you perceive will happen might not actually be the reality and I could just trick myself into taking the action. So cold calling was a huge thing for me. There's nothing scarier than the unknown, the mm. fear of the unknown. Like for me, even like going to get a bank loan, like at this age, I've made a t lot of money in my life, but yeah. I've never gotten a bank loan before. So like, I don't know what questions to ask. I don't know how to go about it. Am I going to come off rude? Am I going to say something wrong? Yeah. And it's just like terrifies, cripples and crippling anxiety. But the second you just go in there and do it, you're like, oh, this company literally exists to give loans. That is their business model. They want to give you a loan mm. and they're trying to help you. Yeah. And once you do it, it's like no brainer. And that's everything I've experienced. And so mm. I think one thing for, let me know if you've experienced this for a lot of agency founders is one, a lot of people like to talk about, oh, I'm going to start an agency. I bought, I got a course, I bought a course. And then they go tell their friends, tell their friends, I'm going to start an agency. And they get like a dopamine hit because they are saying they're going to start an agency. But then once it comes to actually, you know, making their first cold call, making an ad, putting them, taking action, putting themselves in the position to fail, that's when they get blocked. So mm. how did you find that? Like, was it out of pure necessity? Great question, dude. I'm so I'm so glad you asked that because yes, it was literally life or death for me. Like I viewed my life as either I figure out how to make money to survive or I end it. And so it was like, it was life or death. I had no other option. There was no, I want to make 10K a month and buy a Lambo. I didn't give up. I, I said out loud to the universe, God, if I can make $2,500 a month online using this SMMA thing, I will be the happiest person in the world. I said that out loud. 2,500 a month, <laughs> yeah. 100 times that later, I'm still not the happiest person in the world, unfortunately, <laughs> but that's all I wanted in the beginning. I just wanted to survive. That was it. Fuck all the nice stuff in the cloud. Like, I didn't care about any of it. I just wanted to live. I've heard Luke Belmar talk about Newton's third law. What I'm fascinated with is Newton's first law, and it's a object at rest stays at rest, mm. and an object in motion stays in motion mm -hmm. unless acted upon by an unbalancing force. Most entrepreneurs, whether it's politically correct or not to say, are objects at rest. And I was one of them. And the law shows that the reason you're an object at rest is because you haven't been acted upon by an unbalancing force. So for me, my unbalancing force was I had no other fucking option. I had to get into motion. And once I got into motion, I stayed in, mo I stayed in motion, which is the law of momentum, right? Staying at rest is the law of inertia. Staying in motion is the law of momentum. So you have to figure out, I'm at rest, why? What is my unbalancing force? For me, it was people's judgments. It was people's doubts. It was proving people wrong. It was survival. I had an unbalancing force that caused me to get out of rest and get into motion. And if you can be introspective and figure out what that unbalancing force is for you, you will have a source of motivation that is just incredible to tap into, that beats any sort of desire or anything because you have your unbalancing force and your reason for getting out of rest. And mine was just survival. I've never heard that like way of explaining like that met is it a metaphor, that metaphor for like entrepreneurship. There's a lot of yeah. uh, symbiosis, I think, uh, between science and success. Sorry, that really just like resonated with me a lot. That's really interesting. Cause that's like a law of physics, but it also applies. To I'll put it, I'll put, to put it simple, like more simply, my partner, Jared, I love when he says this until the fear of staying the same becomes greater than the fear of change you will remain stagnant mm. that is so fucking interesting okay sorry so basically explain to me you just I'm, that's profound okay so basically explain to me if someone's watching this right like yeah. everyone watching these podcasts are always not everyone but a lot of people watching these podcasts are going to be thinking like they have the perspective that they're going to watch this and be like that's the reason he's successful and I'm mm. not like he had something he had an advantage that I didn't he was in he grew up entitled he grew up rich he was in this circumstance it would never work for someone in my circumstances no one could possibly be thinking that listening to your story in my opinion so what could you possibly say to someone like how do you get someone that has a certain constant mindset or way of viewing the world 
where they are constantly justifying why they are not successful or why someone else is successful and discounting their success for some reason like that. People talk about belief a lot. Mm -hmm. Belief is the biggest key to success, right? You, you must believe to self-development. You must believe. I don't think it's belief. I think it's realization. Okay. Once you realize exactly what you said isn't true, once you realize that, oh, it will never work for a person like me, once you realize that you are truly the captain of your fate and the master of your destiny or whatever the quote is, once you realize that I can actually just shape whatever sort of life I want for myself, and once you actually understand that, that's when life opens up to you. For me, it was going to an event in Mexico, my first networking event ever. I was 18. At the time, I was making $0 a month. And I go into this room full of entrepreneurs, and they're all doing 100K a month, 200K a month, mm. 500K a month, a million a month. And I meet all these people, and I hear their stories, and I listen to them, and I see them, and I, I, I realize they're not that much smarter than me, but they're making 200K a month, 500K a month. I had the realization that it was possible. It wasn't even the belief. It wasn't like, oh, I think I can do it. It was like, I know this is possible. I saw people firsthand who did not go to college who are making half a million dollars a month. I know I can do it too. So like once you see, and that's why I love sharing the story and making content is like, if I can be the source of realization for somebody else to where they say, man, I hated school too. Like, bro, I was ranked 330 out of 400 students. I was in the bottom 25% of my high school. I was in middle school. I was commonly referred to as the worst kid in school. Cause I had the most attentions. I got suspended. Like I was the worst one, bro. If I can go from dropping out in ninth grade, being literally suicidal, hating my life, not wanting to wake up to making millions just a few years later, what the fuck are you capable of? Like that's the game. Explain the process of how you did that. I know it's so nuanced and so many different learning lessons, but you have to talk as long as you want. If you could have to like describe the most impactful, like learning lesson is the most like game changing moments, I guess is the best way to put it. The from, event was from huge. Like start to finish. Yeah. The event was huge. Being in person, the cold calling was huge because I was getting over my fears. Fear paralyzes more people than lack of information ever will. 100%. And so starting to slowly but surely get the small wins, the small wins of picking up the phone and cold calling somebody. What can that lead to? Uh, going to the event, meeting people in person surrounding myself with people who force me to level up or get kicked out of the group. Because again, that tribal fear of if I get kicked out of the group, I'm not safe. Once I leveled up my circle and I was surrounding myself with other six and seven figure entrepreneurs, I had to change who I was or I would have gotten kicked out. Mm -hmm. So I forced it. And uh, JFK tells this incredible story. He shared this with the- with The range the, on these quotes. Let's go. Okay, we'll Mark go Twain, JFK. Look <laughs> at okay, the Buddha. Don't get me started on Buddhism, bro. But- JFK tells this amazing story uh, about the moon landing. And this is how they he claimed that we landed on the moon. Um, this was the reason behind it. He told the story of his grandfather who grew up in um, Ireland. And his grandfather and his school buddies, they would walk home every day from school and they would climb these walls. They would try to climb the highest walls they could. One day, his grandfather and his buddies get to a wall that was so high, they didn't think they could climb it. So what they did, Brett, was they took their hats and they threw their hats that their mothers had made for them, for their school outfits. They threw their hats over the wall. So the only way that they could go and get their hats was by climbing over the wall. So they gave themselves a reason and a necessity to climb over the wall. And when, for me, putting myself in that group of high-level, high-earning entrepreneurs, it was me throwing my hat over the wall and saying, I'm either going to become the person that is worthy of being surrounded by these human beings I'm going to get kicked out and I'm not going to be able to go home because I don't have my hat with me. So I threw my hat over the wall by going to these events, getting in person with these people and building relationships and joining a tribe that I didn't want to get kicked out of. There is zero doubt about it that you are the people that you surround yourself with. And if everyone around you, like my circle here, everyone's making millions of dollars a year. Yeah. We have one friend who their company just got valued at $200 million. Yeah. And they've been building it for the four years. We've known them the whole time. They're our age. And it's like, I thought I was doing amazing holy shit. And then I just, I'm not going out. I'm not doing anything. So right. I'm staying in for the next six months and I want to be at that level because they're going to have a $50 million house and I want to live in the neighborhood still. And is some part of you worried? Like if I don't, I, like I'm going to lose this. It's like some trouble yes. part. Yes, absolutely. Cause like as much as I want to say, these are like my genuine friends and we all have each other's, our each other's backs, like regardless, yeah. if I start slipping, start eating unhealthy, gaining weight, smoking weed all the time, doing all these bad habits, 
they will subconsciously stop hanging out with me because they know that it will like rub off on them. And so it's an unspoken thing. These are my friends. These are my brothers. But at the same time, if you don't have your shit together, you don't deserve to be in this group. And it's like something that is just in our nature. It's just as selfish for you to pull the average down as it is selfish for them to kick you out. Exactly. So if you're going to let them down, of course, of course, they're not going to surround themselves with you anymore. All humans do is compare. Like you say that there's no original thought. We mimic each other. Yeah. Like it's mimetic desire at the same time. Um, like if my friend wants, I think I saw you talk about this too. If my, like if Sebastian or someone wants, like is buying a Urus or looking at a Urus, I never once thought that was a cool car. And then he got it. And then one time I saw like a girl be like, whose car is that? Yeah. And three days later, subconsciously, I find myself on a car website looking to buy a Urus. And I'm like, last week I told someone I don't even like Uruses. <laughs> and now like I like had like a holy shit like perception mo- or like, yeah, just like what is going on? Like I am not in control of what I'm doing right now. We're and mimetic it's, creatures. It's though. freaky. And so the point I'm trying to make is if you're in your local area and all of your friends around you are smoking weed, playing video games, and they work like a job where they make $4,000 a month with their degree and you're making $10,000 a month with your SMMA, you're going to be like, I'm the man. I'm killing it. This is great. But there's no reason to grow. And so intentionally throwing your hat over the wall yes. is the key to leveling up to 100K a month, a million dollars a month, because you have to have that direct, in my opinion, I do, that direct comparison, that direct reason to desire something and being yeah. conscious of the fact that I am not in control of what I desire. Being around people that make me desire in positive ways is the single-handed like cheat code of life because mm-hmm. now I don't even have to like seek it it's just around me that and, makes sense and you're a hundred percent dude that's so well said and you're also constantly growing your realization of what is possible mm-hmm. your friend who has a 200 million dollar company as soon as you said that i was like what am i doing i need to get to like i'm and i'm realized if i met the guy and i talked to him i'm sure i'd be like oh shit i can build a two it's the realization mm-hmm. so you're constantly growing that as you grow your circle too very very powerful and i think you should get a urus <laughs> <laughs> one day <laughs> That's funny. I can't copy so bad. <laughs> so, I think you should get the exact same one. <laughs> just a different color. It would be kind of cool to have a squad roll up in different rainbow uruses. T- rainbow uruses. But <laughs> yeah. Okay. So really, I've loved the conversation. And so really- Thank just, you for having me, man. Yeah, bro. Last thing I really want to talk about. If you guys want to learn, his story is really inspiring. And I wanted to get into your story, but like we're getting close to the end here. So I just wanted to kind of more so focus on at the end, like I always like to ask people, like, who do you learn from? You've quoted so many people. Yeah. But who do you like learn from the most? Who do you, who have you like, who would you uh, like attribute most of your success to at this point? My dad, number one. My dad was a senior VP HR manager for a Fortune 100 company. How he's taught shit. me everything. Like I used to think he had the lame, and like we weren't rich growing up, but like he just had a good job and he had a high level position. But because um, I remember you mentioned the, you know, this kid grew up rich, so of course that he did. I couldn't. We, I was just like middle class. But anyway, my dad had a really important job, I guess, and I used to think it was the lamest thing in the world. And then I had to hire somebody, <laughs> and then I had to manage somebody, mm-hmm. and then I had to deal with I want to raise. I want to quit. Uh, then I deal with, and I was like, okay, what do I do here? And I asked my dad about it one day and he just like opened up this flood of HR wisdom. <laughs> and I was like, damn dad, why did you tell me you knew so much cool shit? Game. <laughs> and uh, now I go to my dad for like HR management advice because he's, you know, hired hundreds and hundreds of people and done it at the highest level. Um, so my dad, number one. Um, and I would throw my mom there as well for just her grit and not giving a fuck what people think about her, bro. My mom's gotten kicked out of more basketball games than other <laughs> anybody got get kicked back. out of, bro. She, she's, at the end of the day, she does. Um, I would also say Alex Ramosi. Very fortunate to have had a conversation with him and, and, and actually chatted with him and learned from him and uh, also just learning indirectly from him for years. I think business-wise, he has influenced me probably more than anybody else. The Buddha. I've learned a lot from studying Buddhism and studying the philosophy that Buddhists hold. And then I would also add jesus to that which is a complete contradiction from buddhism but i think jesus and uh, like king solomon and just some of the wisdom in the bible those things have influenced me probably more than anything else at the same time studying sam altman like i could Mm -hmm. share with you people i study all day long like there's so many i think it really comes from uh, family and then again people like hermosi and some of the wisdom that is in some of these biblical texts as well i think those have been the things that have led my life more than anything else 
I really do think people might overemphasize the n- business knowledge needed to be successful. Yeah. When really it's just about taking the action, doing the uncomfortable things and neglect the spiritual side or the actual like focusing on your happiness. Or the personal side. Personal side. Yeah. Better way to put it. And so that is really interesting for you to say that because I, I watch your content and you do focus a lot on the personal side. I know. And I feel like I've actually been doing it too much because I f- think people are like, all right, dude, like we get it now. And like, I need to post some tactical shit. So um, I'm glad we, I'm glad we did this because I'm like, damn, there's a lot of tactical shit I need to talk about. It's the about, details but... that, that matter most. I do want to ask you though. I yeah. really forgot this. You referenced Billy's course a lot. Yeah. So like what, and you were like a blank slate. Like you could have found a drop shipping course. You could have found an affiliate course. You could have found that. Amazon. Yeah. So like you could have chosen any of these like stereotypical make money online for companies and they're all valid business yeah. models. So what was it about SMMA that really like was like, that's the one that I'm going to do that I could be great at? Logically, it made the most sense to me. It seemed the most duplicatable. Ecom, you have to find the product. You have to create the brand. It's like, there's a lot of yeah. variants and nuance to it. SMA was like, find businesses, sell them Facebook ads and like copy and paste my structure. Help them get customers. The other thing is like, I saw myself in Billy. That is so important. If you can see yourself in a mentor, they'll, they will be able to take you way further because you will be able to believe and realize even more that the things they've done are possible for you too because you see yourself in them. Billy was like kind of this like, you know, awkward, like, kind of introverted guy who seemed to really be honest and care about product. He wasn't a flashy Wolf of Wall Street yeah. salesperson. And I love that about him because I was like, man, like you're not trying to bullshit me. You're not like nice amazing at talking to people. Exactly. Yeah. You just seem like a genuine dude who like figured out how to build something cool. So seeing that in Billy, and I should add Billy to the list of people who've changed my life because 100% he's at the top of that. His $600 course has turned into over $5 million for me in revenue. Damn. So like the say, education system is fucked, by the way. There you can turn a six hundred course into But everyone in the comments is calling online courses a scam these days. So it's just like brother. Jan Henry said something I found very profound. I'll quote another fucking guru. But um he said, I've seen people complain, dispute, and ask for refunds for the same information that I've seen other people become millionaires with. At the end of the day, brother, it's you. You are the X factor. Yeah. So So speak to that. Did you ever think that you were like when you were younger did you have like an ego like you were special you were different you're like you can achieve way more than other people even through the depression and all that did you have that gut feeling somewhere in my core i knew i viewed life way differently but to be honest with you i didn't think it was in a positive way like i didn't think it was i'm so unique i'm capable of something great i thought it was i'm so unique why am i so fucked up (laughs) like i thought it was a bad thing and I, i i think that's normal Maybe. Good. And ironically, like you like, can't tell because everyone, right. found, every signal you're getting is that you're on the wrong path and that you need to conform. Yeah, exactly. And so anything that's not, not conforming, conforming, it's, it feels wrong and you're taught it's wrong and it's programmed from schools, from media, from everything. It's programmed into your mind that if you do not conform, you're doing something wrong. So of course, when I didn't conform, I felt terrible. But so you would say you felt different, but you viewed yourself yeah. as it felt terrible. I never felt like I, fe- I always felt like I don't belong. Because I, I, I find it hard for me. First off, the school system was designed to make you conform and to make you like learn the skills to be an employee. Like that's yeah. literally why our public school system was made. And that's why it's free. Because if they give you the basic skills, you can make the business owners money. It's a really good that's point. I never thought about it like that. Oh, my next video. I have my next video with Luke. We go in on that. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. That's fine. Or exactly that. So, I, But I also find it hard to like come on here and give advice. I'm, like hundreds of thousands of people will watch this. But I genuinely believe that like if you do feel that way, like to your core where like you feel like something's wrong with you because like you think this can't be right. Like you need to find a way to not be in school. Mm. Now, maybe middle school, maybe the first few years of high school you should probably go to, but like 16, 17, if you can like really, if you have the self-motivation and you do like learning and you're looking around like this is not, this can't be right, you're not fit for that system. Mm. Seek educators online. Seek a business model where you can learn step-by-step how to make money and keep practicing because it's going to take three to five years for you to really get good at it where you can compete but eventually you will succeed so do you like have a stance like do you think people should you dropped out of ninth grade that's insane <laughs> so i didn't have the balls i didn't have anyone telling me this again it wasn't balls it was like fear like i hated going to school every day so much that i, I didn't have the balls to go to school so i dropped out mm. so it, it was it was complete necessity do i have an opinion on going to college the numbers here are interesting. Like the actual stat, I could give my opinion all day, but stats show 
people who go to college, people with a college degree on average make 85% more in their lifetimes than people without a college degree. So statistically speaking, most people should probably go to college. It's unfortunate and that data may be outdated in this new economic climate that we're in. I think that if you aren't going to college, you can guarantee similar amounts of success with these three things. And I've talked about this in a video once, but I think it's super important because college at its foundation is a professor. It's a group of students. Mm -hmm. And then it's a ma it's a, a I don't even know what it's called. A major accreditation or something. A, a major. Credit, right. Yeah. You, you get your major, you have your professor and then you have your group. What is online education? It's the same exact thing. You have a mentor who teaches you high ticket sales. You have a community of other high ticket closers. And then you have the skill of actually learning how to sell. So a mentor, a mastermind, and a, a mentor, a skill, and a mastermind. Those are the three things. All that is is college just flipped in a modern way. Mm -hmm. So if you can find a modern high paying skill with a good mastermind and a good mentor, you are going to college. You're just doing it in a way that you want in a way more affordable way that is more in alignment with who you are. With a very clear end goal. Like, I guess the answer isn't don't go to school or go to school. It's just be intentional. Like if you're a STEM major, like if you're going to medical school, medical school go to school. Yeah. Like, don't try to get a medical degree 100%. from an online community. 100%. But if you are like just going to college because I don't know, I'm going to get a business degree. I don't know, I'm going to do journalism because I have to pick one off this list because my parents told me to go to college. Yeah. You're wasting your time and you are setting yourself up for 100%. a miserable life. So it's more so, I guess, if you're self-motivated to learn. Um, that's like my whole mission at this point because I so, feel so jaded by the school system because mm. I went through the whole thing. <laughs> like really I, I graduated and I immediately just started working for myself and I've never used my degree and I've made way more money than yeah. any of any people with my degree. And I just did it because I like had the ego internally. Like my parents wanted me to go to school. My mom wanted me to go to school. So I went through it because I felt like I was doing the right thing by society. It wasn't hard for me. So I just didn't get the degree. Yeah but then work on my side hustle relentlessly every hour I'm not in school. And then hopefully I can liberate myself. You said it was the main thing. Like you're like the reason you, you like your purpose, you feel like is to what flip the education system. Around I feel genuinely somewhere? jaded by the school system. Mm. Like they were, they were not there. I think that was the biggest realization that I had that the world, especially America, no one is here. No one has your best interest in mind. They all have their best interest of growing their bottom line. And America is designed to addict you. You go to the corner, it's marketing for sugar, for fast food, McDonald's, which is an addiction. You can get physically addicted to carbs, to sugar. Yep. Pharma pharmacies, doctors. Doctors have partnerships with Big Pharma, the actual companies who make the drugs. And so there's different brands of Adderall, Vyvanse, Ritalin. Each company has a different back-end deal, like yep. an affiliate program for doctors. And then doctors, yes, they might have your best interest in mind, but they're also more worried about getting a negative review getting someone going like someone saying that this person didn't listen to me so if i go to a doctor and say i yeah. can't pay attention and i want adderall give me adderall if they don't i'll go on google and say yeah. he didn't listen to me i'm seriously in a bad place and this doctor doesn't listen don't or they lose their partnerships because they're not giving anybody any and of that the affects drugs. Their business and so i yeah school was the what firsthand taught me that it also applies to school but firsthand taught me that like we learned the food pyramid in elementary school hmm. which was made up by bread companies to sell more bread and so school taught me firsthand, like these people, everyone that works in the system thinks they have my best interest in mind, yeah. but the system itself was not created to actually help me. Right. And mm. how I felt about it going through that's it. That's a so really good point. That's why I make YouTube videos because I have consumed so much information from real sources like that, like Stanford, go to Stanford. But I'm talking about like university division one schools, like middle of America or whatever. Yeah. It's too expensive. The information is beyond average. You're learning from middle managers of business schools and they're not yeah. trying to teach you how to be entrepreneurs. So yeah. my goal is just totally wanna, disrupt the education system. I want to talk with you more about that. Super interesting. Cause that's what is serve others. Well, that's, that's <laughs> kind of where I was going. Um, I don't know exactly what it is yet, that's but cool. the, I actually like that. the mission is to free the world. And I don't know exactly what that means, but I think there are four levels of freedom. There's financial freedom, mental freedom, physical freedom, and spiritual freedom. I'm not a master at all of these. I don't know all of them. I've learned the financial freedom. I've worked on the mental freedom. I'm not completely free. I still struggle all the time. Um, I think part of becoming mentally free is realizing you are never completely free. You just learn how to manage it. Um, physical freedom, all the bullshit they put into our food and our water that literally programs us to 
uh, feel sick, make us all, uh, don't even get me started. Anyway, um, and then the spiritual warfare that's going on in the world too, mm-hmm. which I'm not very accustomed to, but I have some friends who, who've enlightened me on that stuff. So I just, I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know what I'm going to do. I honestly have no idea, but I know that this website, this idea, this, this came to me and it was put in my lap for some reason. And I know that the mission, however it is accomplished, is the most important mission that I can possibly think of, which is to free the world. Like, think about space travel and what some of these ultra-rich Elon and Jeff, like, they're, well, they're trying to go to another planet, right? And people are like, that's the biggest thing we can do is literally find another uh, planet to to live on and survive on as a community. But you're just going to take the same fucked up, programmed, messed up community and society and put them on another planet. It's not actually solving the problem. It's, again, what we talked about with prescribing drugs rather than solving the core of the problem. Going to another planet is prescribing a drug. <laughs> Freeing the world, I believe, is actually solving the problem. So I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know what I'm going to do. I have no idea, but I know that if I do nothing else on this planet, if I do nothing else with this life, but actually serve others and try to help people and free them in some way, shape, or form while also working on freeing myself completely— I know that I'll, I'll die uh, fulfilled and knowing that I did the right thing. And that's what it is. That's amazing, bro. And I do think the information you shared in this podcast is like a first step in that direction or a great step in that direction. Thanks, so dude. I appreciate you coming on here, bro. Dude, I appreciate you so much for I having me. I appreciate you man. not holding anything back, bro. I felt like I had to share everything. So, I, yeah, man, the fact you DM'd me was incredible. I feel very, very blessed and fortunate to have been on here. So, thank you, man. It wasn't random, bro. It. Where can people find you? YouTube, um, I'm trying to put as much as I can on YouTube and I'm trying to take that content to a new level, value wise. What's this channel name? It's called Matt Shields. If you look up Matt Shields, it should pop up. If you look up like Matt Shields SMA or the Matt Shields, it will pop. If you just look up Matt Shields, it should pop up. Um, Instagram is official Matt Shields. If you DM me, I will always answer. Um, if you try to sell me shit, I might not. <laughs> but if you just DM me, like I try to respond to everybody. Uh, every YouTube comment, every Instagram DM, I could check my phone right now. There's nothing. So like I, I will respond to everybody because I remember when I was a kid reaching out to people that I saw on YouTube and I was like, how cool would it be if this person responded to me? I feel so humbled that some people view me in the same mm-hmm. way right now. So if you message me on Instagram, I will reply. If I seem short or like maybe it wasn't the most in-depth ans- answer, I apologize. But, you know, I'm also working and trying to build companies. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, man, that's it. Instagram, YouTube. That's basically it. Yeah, guys, definitely check out his YouTube. Uh, I would definitely recommend starting with the video, I built six SMAs in a row to prove it's not luck. You'll basically hear his whole story and the lessons he learned along the way. Basically, each one he started after the other just got better because he took what he learned in the previous one to make better decisions. And now he's making $200,000, $300,000 a month. So definitely go check him out. And again, guys, watch this podcast two or three times because that's how you actually absorb information and actually pick it up. Mm. And you can use it every day in your life. And he dropped a lot of insight on like, personal stuff, business itself, even the nitty gritty tactics that we love to get into. But hope you enjoyed this one, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Have a wonderful day.